From the Israel Sports Radio Studios in Jerusalem, Israel Nation's capital, it's Lewis Live. As your host, me, Ari Lewis. Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. It is 6 p.m. local time in Jerusalem. And special welcome and special graciousness to the Formula Jerusalem One people. The racing will go on today and tomorrow. That's why our city, if you are new to Jerusalem, you're seeing all those places being blocked off. Usually it is not like that, but it is this time for the race. So that should be a lot of fun. And congratulations for everyone for putting on a uh, fantastic job out there. Uh, this is Lewis Live. We have so much to talk about. It's our NBA final special, three-hour special. We won't talk just about the NBA, but mostly the NBA. There is also the NHL finals between the Chicago Blackhawks and the Boston Bruins. Three overtimes last night goes to the Blackhawks. Blackhawks were the 2011 Stanley Cup champions and the Bruins, the 2010 Stanley Cup champions. So a face-off of two of the previous champions, or excuse me, two recent champions, uh, not last year's Kings. They did not make it. You can't have three teams in the finals. Uh, there is also the little Tim Tebow signing to the New England Patriots. We will talk about those things as well, but predominantly it will be about the NBA Finals. We are in Finals mode. Game four is tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is uh, four in the morning, approximately here in Jerusalem, if you're thinking of staying up late and watching the game. Miami Heat and the San Antonio Spurs, the Heat, the favorites, the Heat with the better record, the Heat with LeBron James down 2-1 after being blown out by over 30 points in the ball game a few days ago. I, before the series started, had Miami in six. Uh, it's still technically possible, not technically likely, as the Heat would have to win three games in a row for my prediction to come true. For the Heat to be the champions, they will have to win three out of four. For the Spurs to be champions, they will have to go two and two at a minimum, at a maximum, I should say, 500 basketball. So there's a lot of records to indicate, a lot of trends to indicate the Spurs will go on to win as the winner of Game 3 when the series is tied at 1-1 has won 12 out of the 13 times that has come up when you've had this 2-3-2 format that the NBA Finals has adopted in the past 20-plus years or so. On the line to elaborate more, on the Spurs' success, the Miami Heat's difficulties, is the author of Modern Day Maccabees, Andy Gershman. Andy, welcome back to Lewis Live and Israel Sports Radio. How you doing, Ari Lewis? Uh, doing good. Long time no speak. We did speak somewhat uh, off the air. And you are not necessarily so concerned from the Heat's perspective about them being blown out because the Spurs were the losers of a blowout on Game 2. So the blowout, does it bother you so much, or have you had some time to think about it? And it does bother you. No, it really doesn't bother me at all. I think, um, you know, I know in this 2-3-2, I think you're mentioning 92% of the winners come after, you know, whoever won game three. But I think that the difference is you've got two key factors in that blowout. One, LeBron James did not show up. He has vowed to show up. Two, I can't imagine that Green, Leonard, and Neal continue to shoot this way. Um, So I I think you'll see an an even series after tonight. All right, I want to talk about this whole LeBron James vowing to show up. So was it he forgot to show up for Game 3? He doesn't realize it's the NBA Finals. What does that mean exactly? We never heard Jordan or Kobe Bryant say something, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I I forgot about Game 3. Don't worry, I'll get it together for Game 4. So what what were those comments? I don't know if he forgot. Um, I mean, he was definitely there on the court. Um, but he, um, you know, I mean, he was shooting off his back foot. He was, you know, tentative to even shoot. You know, you haven't seen that since that Maverick series um, two years ago. But, you know, it, it's one of those things where I think that he um, he he said he was going to study some tape. I mean, they've definitely done a great defensive job on him, uh, keeping him out of the paint. He's got to get in the paint. He's got to shoot free throws. Uh, he's got to get those guys deep in foul trouble. And, you know, we'll see what happens. A, you know, I know you have Ben on later. Ben has always said that a LeBron-centric team is not a good team. And, you know, it's time for someone other than Mike Miller to step up. All right. um, Before we continue on with the other Heat players, as far as LeBron James, the fact the Spurs have been able to contain him, has not scored over 20 points in the first three games of this series up to this point. 
I'm curious, what is their secret? Because the Heat had that dominant streak, I believe, 44-3. and LeBron James, one vote shy of the United MVP. So the, the rest of the league was not able to stop to him up to this point. What are the Spurs doing differently to keep him out of the paint or to keep him away from the free throw line or whatever has been keeping LeBron James in check? I think because, you know, they've, they've really just cluttered the lane. They have not let him pinch through. Um, you know, he has to remind himself, I think, that he is the the best player on the court, the strongest player on the court, um, a guy that can take it to the hole and, and do it. I mean, LeBron's points are coming off of fast break, you know, transition basketball. Um, and so, I, you know, I think they're just kind of – they're. I don't know if the word is confusing him by their defensive looks. I don't know if he – has played too much into that. I'm going to get everyone else involved first and, and forget it. But don't be surprised if he drops 40 tonight. I do have a funny feeling that he will come out with a vengeance and the series will be tied. But uh, Ben is right that the other players have to step up. And when you look at the rest of the supporting cast, when LeBron got there, was called the big three, but Wade is a very, very old 31 or 32 Chris Bosh is, I, in my opinion, not such an elite player. I know he gets paid like one. Is there a little bit too much made of the Miami supporting cast? And maybe, I mean, the cast obviously better than whatever LeBron had in Cleveland with Mo Williams, but maybe this is not as good a supporting cast as many have thought. Why'd you have to, why'd you have to bring up Mo Williams? We, we have you know? to discuss. I don't think we could properly have a segment without discussing Mo Williams. <laughs> I think that... Um... That Bosch, you know, his days of being a 2010 player and then the All Star game and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, that was Toronto where no one cared and he was the center of attention. Um, I heard it the other day where, you know, a, a, uh, a Chris Bosch is nothing but a European forward. I mean, you know, that's all he is. He's a stringy, I mean, he, he takes more outside shots than inside. Yeah, you know, he's he, he's and and I think with Wade, yeah, I think Wade is I think Wade is old. Wade has the ability to put it together for one game, you know, here and there, and everyone goes, wow, you know, oh, there's the old D Wade. But it happens so infrequently, you know, that uh, you know it is LeBron's team without a doubt. That's without a doubt, and you know, coming up. And the other thing, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was going to bring up that you you mentioned that you know LeBron hasn't scored over twenty in a game. No one cared about that when they when they won, right? You know, in game two, right? Which is very matter. always interesting, you know, to me. It, it's like all of a sudden that becomes the highlight when he was you know dishing out you know all these assists and they went on thirty three to five run in game two. No one cared how many points LeBron had, but you know in game three when they get dominated by Curly Neal and, um, you know, whoever. Um, Almost like Larry Bowen and Curly. We didn't really – I mean, huh? they, they're good players, but we they, – they weren't talked about so much throughout the year, apart for whatever reason. I mean, the Spurs, you think, it managed to only Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, not these guys. Right. Well, you know, and, and you know, it's just a matter of will they go cold. I mean, that's what happened. That's how the Knicks were eliminated. I mean, they shot great all year and they couldn't – you know, shoot the ball when it came down to the playoffs. So we'll see if you know if those guys can keep cranking it. The the difference is that Popovich is good enough to make adjustments. If they're not if they're not cranking it, he'll take it out of their hands. I mean, let's be honest. With all this said done, they're down. You know, and all the LeBron criticism. I mean, Tim Duncan has had a horrible series. Yep. You know, Tony Parker is hurt. We'll see how hurt he is. He has a strained hamstring. And he says he'll go tonight, but let's see how effective he is. If he can't cut to the lane, then he's not very effective because he's not a great shooter. And Manager Ginobili is plays out of control. I mean, you know, he, you know which Manager Ginobili is going to show up. So then you, with, with all those three factors, then you go back to relying on Neil and Leonard and Green, and you know, see how it goes. Uh, first of all, in regards to Wade, he is 31 years old, and it's not that 31 is actually so old, but just for him, some players, when they get south of 30, they become old. He's one of those guys. With that being said, next year LeBron has the option to opt out of this contract with Miami. There's been rumors about him going back to Cleveland, playing with Kylie Irving under his old couch, Mike Brown. What are your thoughts? Uh, are we seeing one more year left to LeBron James before he gets out of town? 
Um, so being next year will be the last year. I think it depends on titles. I really do. But, if he manages to get a ring this year and goes deep next year, maybe, maybe. Um, let's say it this way. Let's say they know, lose. You know, let's say they lose this series, right? Next, Then I, you're going to hear well, a lot of problems in the offseason. I think he stays in Miami. Really? Okay. Yeah. I think that, you know, he'll be one of those guys who came to do, you know, something. But, you know, also remember these big three pair-ups and everything. Now, I mean, LeBron, because of the whole decision, we all go back to that. I, I get it. But remember, I mean, the Celtics big three only produced one title as well. You know, um, you know, sometimes these guys catch lightning in a bottle. I mean, this team is going to be looked at as not, you know, accomplishing what it wanted to. Uh, but they're in the third, the championship series three years in a row. That's true. So That's true. You know, and a good point with the big three from the Celtics. Um, we'll go back to the finals, but a couple of questions wanted to ask in regards to coaching. Jason Kidd reaches a deal with the Nets. Ewing is about to be named the Bobcats head coach. These are two former players, two Hall of Fame players. Um, Kidd not official Hall of Fame, but he certainly will be. And there's a stat, I believe 13 coaches this year have been fired, including or quote-unquote left, including the reigning coach of the year. Uh, half of those, I believe, were on the – postseason, something that affects some crazy statistic. Is this are we now gonna see a new coaching carousel? Usually you see a guy get fired, it comes back to another team. Kid and Ewing, two new guys, so will we start to see some fresh blood in regards to coaching? So I was under the impression that Ewing was hired as a uh, assistant, not as a head coach. Hey, oh apologies for that. You're right, correct, assistant. But uh, Ewing's wanted okay. to be a head so coach for a while, all, but still first idea. Of all, you know, that's one of the biggest travesties. I mean people talk about, you know, creating a, a um, environment for minority coaches, how Jason Kidd gets a job before um, before Patrick Ewing is just absurd. I mean, Patrick Ewing has been doing his bench duties, has been working with players. I mean, I don't get this move by the Nets. And not to mention, Jason Kidd has gone back and hired our good friend, our um, Lawrence Frank, as his assistant, somebody they fired, you know, the boy from the little the year from Teaneck, New Jersey. I mean, that just to me seems absurd. The whole thing. I, I don't get it. It's a three year deal. Um I don't know. I don't really understand this move at all. I will say one thing regards to race, kid is half black, whatever that, that is worth. But as far as him being a coach I just don't see him being mature enough. He just got out of done playing last year at a DUI incident while he was a member of the Knicks. He hit uh, some cable pole or something like that. He's had, obviously, in Phoenix, he had the domestic uh, violence incident. He flipped off the fans when he came back to Phoenix. He seems like an immature person. I don't think you could have someone like that be a head coach. I know he's a point guard, and point guards to head coaches is a good transition, but I don't know if he's going to really last so long in New Jersey. Well, not to mention... Um... Take a look at the history of good players, good coaches. Right, we've not, talked about this not too. Not a great history. We've talked about this many times before. Right. I mean, you can count them. You know, on your hand, Larry Bird being one of the few that was able to do it. Um, I'm, and I don't mean good players. I mean great players because Kid was a great player. Um, I don't know. It's it's a weird, strange move. The other one I hear is um, that Doc Rivers – to the Clippers. What do you think of that? Right. I was about to bring that up. I mean, let's first talk about, by the way, that that scenario that we discussed where the good player, not a great player, is a good coach. Doc Rivers, Phil Jackson, Mark Jackson, That's uh, those are typically your great coaches, uh, not someone like Jason Kidd, partly because the star expects everybody to be a star, can't relate to the rest of the team. The the bench guys or the fourth, fifth outside guys do better as coaches. Let's talk first about, before Rivers go to L.A., I mean, it, if Rivers sounds like he's going to leave Boston, he was asked about the process. He said he didn't want to comment on it. It sounds like he's about to go. First, let's talk about the chances of him leaving Boston. What do you rate it? 50 50, 60 40? What do you think will be? I think it's 50 50 at this point. I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, Danny Ainge and the Celtics refused to grant permission to New Jersey, you know, to talk to Rivers. So that's an interesting move. Huh. Before the whole kid thing, and now this whole Clippers thing has come up. So, 
I think it's 50 50. I don't really understand it. I, I mean, I don't know why he would want to leave other than he feels like it's done and he wants to move on to somebody with greater potential. I don't know. Um, I mean, if you want to compare history of franchises, I think Celtics obviously would be a um, wiser choice, but, you know, maybe change of scenery. You know, they always have that thing where, you know, Larry Bird used to always say, what, Coaches, three years. Uh, people start listening to coaches after what five years, three years. Whatever. He said he said three. That's why he only coached for three years. Rivers has been there uh, seven years, I believe, and won won the title, and went to the NBA Finals another time. But, but what I'm trying to say is, if Rivers is fifty fifty, does that mean we're done with Paul Pierce or Kevin Garnett? I mean, you figure if they were both coming back, Rondo coming off the injured list, he would give another run because they would be in contention as much as anybody else in the East. Well, you know, you can couple it with all those rumors that Garnett and Pierce were going to go to the Clippers at one point. <laughs> right. So, Maybe that's why. That, who okay, knows? so Who knows? Maybe there's something there. <laughs> all three go to L.A. They are very close, especially Garnett and Doc Rivers. We're on the line right now. with well, Andy. And, and Pierce is from L.A. So That's right. He went to UCLA, I believe, for college. No, so. no I believe it's Kansas, but. Oh, Kansas, excuse me. That's Reggie Miller, I'm thinking But he's from, but he's originally from that line. Right. That was brought right in the uh, NBA Finals. We're on the line right now with Andy Gershman, author, author of Bowery Maccabees. Let's, uh, before we go back to the NBA Finals, switch gears really quickly to the NFL. Your team, one of your teams, because you have a couple, but one of your teams signs Mr. Tebow is the third-string quarterback. Belichick, hilarious as ever, in the press conference saying he's talented, he works hard, he's a smart player. Is that true? Is he talented, works hard, and a smart player? Because I didn't know that before Coach Belichick said that to the media. So, you know what, this is great because I was going to bring this point up. See, you're making fun of Bill Belichick, right? Right. For what he says. And yet ESPN is running this, like, 10-minute thing on the how cool it is that Popovich doesn't answer any questions. I saw that piece, right. it's funny how that seems to be embraced as just status quo, but people with the NFL go nuts whenever Belichick doesn't answer a question. So, is there is it what what is it exactly? The only I mean, thing why, I can think of why is it okay to be an arrogant basketball coach but not an arrogant football coach? The only they thing, both have three rings the way I see it. Actually, Papa has four, even has one more ring than, than Belichick. I think. Oh, oh, Phil Jackson says one of those reigns is an asterisk because it's 99 and Phil wasn't coaching and it was a strike year. Uh, but <laughs> and then speaking of arrogant coaches, I think with Popovich, uh, maybe he gets a bit of a pass because he seems, you know, he was a, uh, almost a CIA agent and maybe he looks more as clever or angrier and Belichick looks more creepy. Maybe that's what's saying. He got the hoodie on. Uh, he looks a little weirder, and maybe that's what it is. I don't know, but it's true. I see similarities to both those guys. Um, I think they're both very, very good at what they do. I think Belichick is better because football, it's harder to win three Super Bowls than Popovich winning four. But uh, it's true. That is a double standard. That's not fair to Bill Belichick. I still thought it was funny, but, though. But anyway, go back to your point. Um, Get no, I think Tebow. all those things are true, you know, and it's funny because I can tell you – this will be a dead subject. Yeah, they asked. I don't know if you saw the interview with Brady about Tebow. I mean, you tell me that wasn't the most corporate answer you've ever heard. See, no one needs to worry about whether or not, you know, Tim Tebow is going to start and, and for the Patriots. So now it's just a matter of saying whatever the corporation wants you to say, which is, hey, he's been successful in this league. He won two national titles. He worked hard. He's a good, you know, good guy to have in the locker room. I'm gonna, we're going to teach him the Patriot way and see what happens. I mean, what <laughs> more could you ask for, right? <laughs> and everyone's going to hold hands, sing kumbaya, and he will be the. It will go from being the highest jersey sold for a backup quarterback to the highest jersey sold for a third string quarterback. And you know what? I heard this the other day, and I, it wouldn't. When I heard it, I just kind of laughed out loud because I thought. You know what? It wouldn't surprise me if they, you know, sign Tebow, keep him inactive for the entire year except for two games a year. They'll roll him out against the Jets just to stick it to Rex Ryan two more times. 
and move on, you know, because that's just how Belichick works. <laughs> it's very, you never know. You never know. He, part of the reason they thought they got Josh McDaniels before the playoff game against the Broncos was to get some edge just for that particular game, and they thought they might fire him afterwards. So you never know with Belichick. Right. Uh, right. You, I mean, Josh McDaniels, you know, he's the one who drafted Tebow. So, in the first know, round. I, mean, I don't know. I, I'd have a feeling they must have had some conversation saying, you know, we're going to roll you out. You're going to be our third string quarterback, and you might play a little tight end. You might, you know, run, play be a fullback a couple of times. You know, keep in mind that the the Patriots, the Wildcat was basically invented, I think, by Miami. But the Patriots, when they destroyed the Patriots, but the Patriots have always kind of played these. You know, Troy Brown was a receiver who played, in, you know, corner and. You know, they you do it with Edelman where they have him play some defense. So they, they like to take these versatile guys and move them around. So who the heck knows what they'll do with uh with Tebow. And you know what? Again, it's the Patriots. He's not gonna be the starting quarterback, so it doesn't really matter. I was actually saying this on the uh, Sports Rabbit with Yossi Goldstein about I think that Belichick could might <laughs> use him for defense. I mean he could use it for anything. Well, he, he could, and, you know, like I said, you know, who the heck knows? I mean, you know, they do all kinds of stupid stuff up there, and, and it's all based on Bill Belichick's ego. So, right. you know, don't don't be surprised if they don't run him out there against Denver, run him out there against the Jets, you know, just to say, huh, you couldn't do anything with this guy? We can, you know, because that's how they work. All right, last. And, um, it's funny how all these guys who hated uh, Tim Tebow last year, all these talking former former um, Patriot talking heads like Teddy Bruschi and uh, Troy Brown, the one of them, and Rodney Harrison. All of a sudden, this is a great move to pick right. up Tebow. It's because they they know that they've already kissed the ring. And so they better stay in the family because they know what happens when they don't. <laughs> right. All right. So last uh, <laughs> last few minutes with you, we'll go right back to the NBA Finals. What do you expect to happen tonight? You said LeBron, big game. You expect the Miami Heat to win tonight, I take it. I think they'll tie it up tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 I think they'll be able to – I think it's going to be a close game. It's going to be like the game one. But um, I think LeBron is going to basically say – you know, I think he, he he does read the headlines. He does he did sit in that press conference which he looked mighty uncomfortable in, and um, I think he'll just kind of take it to him as much as possible, and and I think he'll come out ahead. I think it's going to be a, a lower scoring game, but I think that they will. Um, I think they'll win. I think they'll win close. It'll probably be like four or five points. All right. So give us final prediction. You're thinking it'll be in the 80s. Yeah, let's go 80, 86-81. Why not? 86-81 for Andy Gershman, thinking the Heat will tie the series at two. And then the final three games, if they go to game seven, one will be in San Antonio game five, then the next two will be in Miami. So we are in for a long series, hopefully at least, and very entertaining stuff. Andy Gershman's book, Modern Day Maccabees, can be found on Kendall, also Amazon. Any other uh, places we could find it or any speaking engagements, anything else you want to promote? Uh, no, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, get your child a good book to read over the summer. Something they'll be interested in, not something that they're going to fall asleep to. Uh, pack it in their little suitcase when they head off to summer camp. Oh. Modern day Maccabees. Um, and one last thing. I know you're a big hockey fan. Yeah. The Bruins, they're okay no matter what. New York, Neil Amrani. He's become a big Blackhawks fan, apparently, overnight. Um, <laughs> and no matter what he says, it was game one in a seven-game series, and as we all know, the series doesn't start until the home team loses. Well, you so. can almost say it was game one and game two with three overtimes. So imagine yeah, so both teams was, would be tired. It was, um, yeah, it was, they were tired, and um, – they had a bad injury in the first overtime, which kind of left them shorthanded on that bench there for two more runs. But it was a great game. It really was an unbelievable game. Um, I thought Chicago, funny for, for a team who went a little deeper in the previous round, I thought Chicago looked looked like they were out hustling. I don't know. It looked like they had better legs there. 
Um, who knows that long trip from Boston to Chicago, my own. Also, I think the NHL uh, got very lucky that we got these two teams in the finals. It's not New York and L.A., but it might be better. These are two of the original six, uh, two of the last three champions, and both with great hockey tradition. So the NHL right. almost lost the entire season, and this is what we get in the finals, so that's pretty lucky for them. Yeah, I mean, they really did. And, and two teams that have been great all year. I mean, Chicago, it, it, I mean, as much as I want the Bruins to win, Chicago certainly deserves to win this cup. I mean, they you know they started off what it was seventeen games without a loss. Um, I mean, it's it's really they're an unbelievable team. But I think it's going to be a long series, and um, I think that if every game goes into triple overtime, you'll have um, <laughs> what hockey really what hockey really needs is uh, fans actually talking about the sport. But unfortunately for me, that means my my ten year old will be up till one o'clock in the morning every night. So Yeah, and we'll be up till probably nine or ten or something of that effect. <laughs> but a lot of people in Jerusalem don't have jobs anyway, so it doesn't really matter I suppose on that on that end. <laughs> All right, Andy, we'll let you go. Uh, enjoy. Right. Thank you for being on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. We'll have fun watching Game Four tonight and chatting on Facebook about it. That's right. All right, enjoy. All right, be well. Andy Gershman, right, the author of Modern Day Maccabees here on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio dot com. Great, great stuff. You hear his prediction. He says the Heat will win Game 4 in a close close uh, battle, close fight. Score will be in the 80s, and the Heat will pull it off by a few points. He thinks big, big games will occur for LeBron James. Oh, a big game will occur tonight. I didn't ask about the rest of the series if he thinks LeBron will step it up. But I assume if they tie it up at two games apiece, that LeBron will figure out a way to suck it up and get three more games done for the Heat. Uh, we're in, though, for a good series, I think, most likely. Unless the Spurs win. Then the Spurs will probably win it in five. So, uh, wow. I, I think I'll get my prediction at the end of the show. But uh, I don't think most people thought, to a man, if you're looking in the mirror, or, or a woman, if you're watching or listening to this program, or watch this on YouTube, that to a man they thought that the Spurs would have 2-1 at this point. Although Ben Block did. We'll have Benny on uh, later. But he certainly thought that the Heat were in trouble. He thought it would be similar to 07 when the Spurs swept LeBron James' Cleveland Cavs back then. We'll discuss more on the other side. Big, big guest coming up on the other side, NBA Dave. Huge, huge Lewis Live fan. We're a fan of his as well. He's been on a long time. We'll get him on in a few minutes. This is Lewis Live on Israel, sportsradio.com. You're tuned in to the only all-sports talk network in the Middle East, israelsportsradio.com. Hey folks, Kagan here. As you know, I'm always staying on top of the fitness world, keeping up with current trends. One form of exercise that's been around for ages and is currently being rediscovered is suspension bodyweight training. So if you're looking for a way to get in shape, improve your health, and train your body to move in new ways, then the X1 by Israel Gym Systems is for you. Find out more on our website at www.israelgym.com or look for our page on Facebook. Israel Gym Systems X1. Israel Gym X1. Pigia Hasman. You're already using a credit card every day. Why not feel good every time you make a purchase? When using the HAS Advantage Support Israel Visa Card, a percentage of each purchase you make will be donated to your choice of 24 Israeli-based charities while still earning a reward point for every dollar spent. But wait, these rewards are even better than the standard rewards you get, especially when using them towards Israel travel with the best conversion rate on El Al's Matmid Frequent Flyer Program. Earn double points at some of your favorite supermarkets and restaurants in the U.S as well as discounts all over Israel. If you love traveling and supporting Israel, HAS Advantage is the card for you. Just give us a call toll-free at 1-866-6-ISRAEL. Sign up right now with the code ISR10 to earn 2,500 bonus points. That's 1-866-647-7235. HAS Advantage. Earn rewards. Support Israel. Offer valid for U.S. citizens only. Terms and conditions do apply. When dialing from within Israel, please dial 1-800-200-818. Israel Sports Dynamics specializes in football consulting, equipment, uniforms, and more. Great brands such as Nike, Russell Athletics, Shut Sports Products, and many more. Just one call away with over 30 years coaching experience with university and professional athletes. Harry Hill, owner of ISD, can advise you. 
for all your sports needs. Call 054-581-3248. That's 054-581-3248. Or visit our website at www.isdisrael.com. If that's not easy enough, click on the ISD banner on the Israel Sports Radio website and be part of the game. Are you tired of paying for expensive gym memberships that you don't use? Are you frustrated by not seeing results? It's time for the X1. Israel Gym Systems is proud to launch the X1 Suspension and Bodyweight Training System. Lose weight, build muscle, improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. With your purchase of the X1, you'll receive a free membership to IsraelGym.com and access to our archives of videos and exercise plans. Sign up today at www.israelgym.com and get ready for the new you. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hazman. Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelSportsRadio.com. Back here in Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. Our thanks again to Andy Gershman, author about a Mac piece for appearing on the program. Again, you can pick up that book at Amazon and Kendall. Great gift for the summer, so go ahead and check that out. We have a great show left the rest of the way. We're here until 9 p.m. local time. We'll have an Andy Dorf from Dorf on Sports, Big Benjamin Bloch. A couple other surprises in store, so you definitely want to stay tuned. It's our NBA Finals Special 2013 edition. On the line right now, really, folks, we cannot have an NBA Finals show without our next guest. He is the man that knows the NBA inside and out. Please welcome back to Lewis Live. It's really been too long. NBA Dave. NBA Dave, welcome back to the program. How you doing? How you doing? Great to be on the show. It's, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been uh, too long. First, though, uh, i got to tease you a little bit. Does it bother you somewhat that the Knicks aren't there, or do you say, hey, the Knicks – the Knicks had a good season when all of a sudden done. What are your thoughts about the Knicks season this year? I would like them to get uh, to the conference finals. I didn't need them to win the, to win the whole thing and expect them to win the whole thing. I didn't believe in them, um, you know, in September and October before, you know, when the season was getting started, right before the season got started. But they did, uh, they did surprise me, and I was, I was into it. You know, I, I appreciated what they did. I think they had a great season. But I would have called it a perfect season if they would have made it to the conference finals. I did not need them to beat the man. I didn't think they can. And uh, look, they were they were outmatched by Indiana. I don't. Uh, I give them full credit. Indiana sort of snuck up on me. I know people were giving them a lot of credit all season long. I they slipped under my radar. But uh, Hibbert, I gotta tell you, uh, impressed me. His size is a matchup disaster for almost any NBA team today. Um, he's probably just been another guy uh, back in the days of Kim Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, but uh, today he's something special, and uh, they 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 did a job on the Knicks, which I tell you they did. There are too many. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. There are too many seven three guys oh. uh, walk around with that type of uh, blocking power, defensive power. Uh, it is interesting. Also, we'll, we'll talk about the Knicks just for a few more minutes before they go to the NBA Finals. Carmelo Anthony got the one vote LeBron James needed to be the unanimous MVP. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I think Melo, Melo is the kind of guy, he always comes up for discussion. Is he a team player? Is he a selfish player? Is he that guy? You know, MVP is about the guy who has the most significant impact on his team. And I believe, uh, you know, Melo deserves a vote. Um, LeBron, although you do see it a little bit in this series, and, you know, in this uh, postseason, you know how important LeBron is to his team. And, but, uh, and, you know, on the other end, you see it, you see it the other way as well. Look. Look, LeBron's not getting it done by himself, and he's pretty much by himself over the last uh, couple series. So, so I believe you know Carmelo definitely has the biggest impact on his team, and the New York Knicks without Carmelo Anthony, you know, are probably not a playoff team. If yes, an eighth seed, and that's in the Eastern Conference. So I I gotta say Carmelo definitely deserved that vote, and uh, I would have thought he would gotten even you know more than that. So yeah, you know, I'm all I'm all for it. Uh, LeBron doesn't need another MVP. He needs some rings <laughs> on his fingers. <laughs> well said there. Uh, all right. Now, um, before we go actually directly to the NBA Finals, I want to talk about the West because a lot of people thought OKC would be there. Uh, I certainly thought, I mean, the Lakers, a lot of people had them before. They couldn't really coexist together as a team and the injury to Kobe Bryant. But a lot of people had OKC after the Lakers. And then Westbrook goes down. What do you think, had they had Westbrook, would that have been enough to go to the NBA Finals again. Your thoughts? I think Westbrook could have gotten them to the Finals. I think the two of them together, um, you know, Kevin Durant is a superstar. 
Westbrook's an all-star. But I think the two of them together, and, you know, I liked their team, you know, two years ago more than, you know, this past year. Um, you know, I don't like the move they did with Boston then, with Perkins, and but, you know, it turned out well for them. Bottom line is, uh, Westbrook is Westbrook's a powerhouse. He's really good. He, he, he plays a role very well alongside Kevin Durant. And you don't have that often. I think the last time you've seen somebody so good that keep that, you know, number two man in perspective might have been Scottie Pippen. Now, I'm not saying that Westbrook's as good as Scottie Pippen. All I'm saying is that playing alongside a superstar, there's, there haven't been that many people that do it as well, you know. Kobe and Shaq obviously were two superstars. They weren't, you know, the, the same kind of situation. Where here you have a guy who's pretty much second to the king and plays that role very well. And with him going down, it really, it really hurt them. I think um, I'm not a big believer in the Spurs. I don't care that they're up 2-1. I'm not a believer in the Spurs. I think they lack the magic. They lack the drive. They lack the agility. They might go ahead to win the finals and all sound silly. I still don't have a big believer in the Spurs. So I think uh, a healthy OKC would have had a wonderful, a wonderful run. All right, now let's go. To, um, no. Let's go to the NBA Finals now because you're talking about you don't care. The Spurs are up two one. Did you think Game Three was just a massive, massive fluke? And we're going to look for the Heat to dominate the rest of the way. Give us your thoughts about Game Three and what happened. Well, I mean, as much as I don't believe in the Spurs, I got to tell you, Miami sort of came out and shocked me. Uh, you know, I know Wade's not playing at 100%. Um, you know, Bosh, I don't know what up with him. You know, <laughs> this is not the big three that not- were the big three, you know, in year one and two of their, you know, them getting together. I expected them to come out with a lot more passion, with a lot more drive. I expected LeBron to be doing these, you know, 40-plus points a game, even though when you play alongside Wade and Bosch, it's difficult to do, you know, 40-plus. I thought he was going to come out hammering. And, you know, I don't think they're playing. I just don't think they're playing their, 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 their full self. You know, Miami can do better. Miami is a team that can go out there and destroy, you know, top-tier teams. They can do it. I do believe that they can. And, you know, so I don't believe in San Antonio. I believe in Miami's abilities. So it's, it's sort of like, you know, a little bit of the inverse of where San Antonio, I don't believe has the ability. They're going ahead and getting it done. And Miami, who has all that ability, with all the support and Ray Allen and Mike Miller, and, I mean, whatnot, they got everything they need, and they're just not getting it done. And if you can't get it done in the NBA Finals, when are you going to get it done in the Summer League? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Well I don't said. know. I expect them to come out and and, and and cheer them apart, like, you know, game two, but who knows? All right, uh, this is something I'll be asking a lot through the program. Definitely got to get your thoughts about this. Let's say, though, the Heat do lose and don't get the championship this year. LeBron James can opt out of his contract next year. There are rumors about him going to Cleveland, Kylie Irving, Mike Brown. If they don't get the title this year, is this the end of this experiment as we know it? No, not at all. You think he's in Miami for the long call? Yeah, he's, he's in Miami for the, next, for the next, you know, six, seven years. Interesting. Okay. Least. I think I think they'll do another another five year contract or something like that. But Wade is Wade is thirty one, but he's an old thirty one. He's not the same as he once was. Bosch is a as described a European player, a big guy, six ten, that doesn't like to drive or get hurt. He likes to shoot long twos and threes. So if you're LeBron James, are you bothered by the supporting cast? Will you go to management and say, You gotta give me another player if you want me to stick around a few more years in South Beach? Well, I mean, look, you, what is he, he can't expect to play on the same team as, you know, how about this, keep D-Wade and bring in, and keep Bosch, and also bring in maybe somebody like, uh, you know, Kevin Durant and, <laughs> and Dwight Howard. I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, like, right. hey, you know, this is, not, this is not Olympic basketball over here. It's not Team USA. He, he has pretty much the best supporting pass he can get. He's got the shooters. He's got Miller and Allen. He's got the defense. Pretty much, he's got Haslam. He's got D Wade. D Wade is no slouch. You know, I know D Wade's not been healthy. I know D Wade, like you said, he's an old thirty-one. That's a great, great way to put it. But he's playing the game for another couple of years, and I mean, well, well he can't really expect more. I don't think he's opting out. I don't think he's opting out of his. You know, of his, I don't think he's he's leaving Miami so quick. Pat Riley is a master salesman. We. He's a he's a slick back here at the car car sale used car salesman. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. He's, he's, not, he's not letting him go. You know he's not letting him go. Pat Riley. He's not leaving Miami. Miami's 
pretty much. I mean, it's Miami, New York City, and Los Angeles, so the three biggest, you know, cities, uh, you know, for for a guy like LeBron to be in. So if he's not going to New York, he's not going to Los Angeles. I don't think he's going back to Cleveland. He takes the good life. He's been in South Beach. He's been, right. you know, he's been all over the place. He's got American Airlines Arena. It's the media. It's culture. It's not going anywhere. All right. Uh, before we go back to the NBA Finals, uh, since you did mention Dwight Howard, you know, possibly go to Miami. Uh, do you think he's done in L.A.? Well, I mean, it seems like him and Kobe Bryant really couldn't coexist. And Dan Tony doesn't know how to use Howard. Howard is probably the fourth guy on that team. There's also talk that him and Paul Gasol really can't play together. So what do you think happens to Dwight Howard? I mean, we went through this last year. Where was Dwight going to go? We're going through it again. Where do you see him playing next season in the NBA? I think, I mean, Dwight Howard, I personally, I said this actually on Lewis Live. I remember where I was. I think the day he signed with with the Lakers, I think he's had it for a disastrous career, which sort of like slowly fades away, and everybody also forgets about him. I mean, I may be wrong. He may come back and get put a ring on his finger one day, but I, I, I don't know about Dwight Howard. I, I don't see him lasting in L.A., but I don't see him going to another organization and, you know, being in a small market and all of a sudden blossoming. I can't find the right guy to put alongside him either. You know I think might be best off with him? Maybe Los Angeles Clippers. The Clippers, interesting. What do you say to that? Well, there's some talk about him going to the Rockets. That's the dominant theory. Clippers, I like that. I mean, that could be very, very good for him. Um, I think he needs a good – he needs a solid point guard that plays a typical point guard. Nash is not a – when I say not a typical point guard, he kind of does whatever needs to get done. He's kind of like in uh, the karaoke terms, meaning he just – um, I'm trying to think of the best way. An improv guy. That's the way I'm trying to say. He's an improv guy, exactly. and he needs more of a Trisha point guard. And um, he, Dwight Howard is a weird kid. That is the best way I describe him. There's there's something a little off with him. I think he doesn't take things seriously enough. I think he's smiling and laughing a little bit too much when they're losing. So um, he might. I don't think a big spotlight city like or franchise that the Lakers will work. The Clippers have the big spotlight in that it's Los Angeles and that he'll still have a good life, but it's not the same as the Lakers. So maybe that's a good fit that there or Houston. Uh, let's talk about some coaching changes that have been made. Jason Kidd has going to be the home. Uh, Jason Kidd has been announced as the head coach for the Nets. Um, your thoughts about that former Nick played last year in New York. Uh, what are your thoughts about him being a head coach down in the NBA right after a few days after he retired? I found it very strange. Uh, I found it very strange. She must, you know, I mean, look, of all players to go straight from playing to be a coach, I'd say it's got to be Jason Kidd. Uh, you know, he, he's a smart man. He's respected by everybody in the league. Um, he, I find it a little strange that Brooklyn in this situation is willing to go to coach that has no winning experience as a coach yet. Because Brooklyn's not one of those teams that has, you know, a decade to build up. Brooklyn's in the now. You know, you, we, we know what's going on in Brooklyn. It is so hip and hop. And, I mean, it's, you know, Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's got to perform. You know, like he's got Prokhorov. He's got Billy King. I mean, there are good people in that organization. They're lacking that flash player, you know, that would sort of, like, coexist with Jay-Z. I know he's not an owner, but he's, you know, he's there in the background. Um, you know, with all that hype about Brooklyn, you know, it's not just the Brooklyn Nets that's hype. It's it's actually, you know, it's a lot more than that. The whole, the whole Brooklyn area, you know, it, it became this young, hot, you know, trendy place. And Brooklyn's got to do something now. To go with Jason Kidd, who is a brilliant basketball mind. I mean, he's absolutely brilliant. He's poised, he's calm, and he's got the great mentality for a coach. But to go with no coaching experience straight into a team like that, I don't know. It surprised me. Billy King's, you know, made some great decisions. This was a little bit of a surprise to me. Yeah, I mean, you go on Ewing, the other hand, this was brought up by Andy in the last segment. Ewing's paid his due. He's been assistant for a long, long time and done strength and condition, whatever he's needed to do, work with the big man. And he's still an assistant. He's going to be assistant with the Bobcats, it looks like. Kid doesn't have to pay his dues and becomes a head coach in a big market like Brooklyn. Something seems to be a little off there. Uh, NBA Dave, we know you have to go. So last question Let's get a prediction for you. Game four, what will happen, and what will happen the rest of the series? Miami Heat versus the Spurs in 2013. Go ahead. Tonight, Miami will win. I'm not going to call it a blowout, but I think they'll control the whole game. Um, they'll tie it up at four, and I think it's I think it's Miami in seven. 
Miami at seven. All right, so you think we're in a log series, Miami Heat and the Spurs. So a very, very entertaining stuff. Uh, NBA Day, thank you for coming on Lewis Live. It's been too long. We'll have to – hopefully we'll have you on again uh, before the NBA Finals is over, especially yeah, – if... Yeah, let's do this again. This was fun. I missed those days. Okay, so we'll do All it right. again. And if it goes seven games, we'll certainly be able, able to have you on before uh, the Finals ends because we'll have another week of the stuff. So that would be great stuff. All right, NBA Dave, be well. We will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great show. Looking forward. Thank you. Be well. NBA Dave, everybody. Great to have NBA Dave here on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. We're going to take a commercial break. We'll have more on the other side again. Some special guests coming up the rest of the way. We're going to have on David Dobin, who is uh, just a genius talk show host. Great, great stuff. Always very informative. He'll give us uh, some answers to what happened to the Heat in Game 3, what will happen the rest of the way. Big Benjamin Bloch. Andy Dorf from Dorf on Sports, and much, much more. So stay tuned. This is Lewis Live on IsraelSportsRadio.com. You're tuned in to the only all-sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Hey, folks. Kagan here. As you know, I'm always staying on top of the fitness world, keeping up with current trends. One form of exercise that's been around for ages and is currently being rediscovered is suspension bodyweight training. So if you're looking for a way to get in shape, improve your health, and train your body to move in new ways, then the X1 by Israel Gym Systems is for you. Find out more on our website at www.israelgym.com or look for our page on Facebook, Israel Gym Systems X1. Israel Gym X1. Higia Hasman. You're already using a credit card every day. Why not feel good every time you make a purchase? When using the HAS Advantage Support Israel Visa Card, a percentage of each purchase you make will be donated to your choice of 24 Israeli-based charities while still earning a reward point for every dollar spent. But wait, these rewards are even better than the standard rewards you get, especially when using them towards Israel travel with the best conversion rate on El Al's Matmid Frequent Flyer Program. Earn double points at some of your favorite supermarkets and restaurants in the U.S as well as discounts all over Israel. If you love traveling and supporting Israel, HAS Advantage is the card for you. Just give us a call toll-free at 1-866-6-ISRAEL. Sign up right now with the code ISR10 to earn 2,500 bonus points. That's 1-866-647-7235. HAS Advantage. Earn rewards. Support Israel. Offer valid for U.S. citizens only. Terms and conditions do apply. When dialing from within Israel, please dial 1-800-200-818. Israel Sports Dynamic specializes in football consulting, equipment, uniforms, and more. Great brands such as Nike, Russell Athletics, Shut Sports Products, and many more. Just one call away with over 30 years coaching experience with university and professional athletes. Terry Hill, owner of ISD, can advise you for all your sports needs. Call 054-581-3248. That's 054-581-3248. Or visit our website at www.isd. I-S-R-A-E-L dot com. If that's not easy enough, click on the ISD banner on the Israel Sports Radio website and be part of the game. Are you tired of paying for expensive gym memberships that you don't use? Are you frustrated by not seeing results? It's time for the X1. Israel Gym Systems is proud to launch the X1 Suspension and Bodyweight Training System. Lose weight, build muscle, improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. With your purchase of the X1, you'll receive a free membership to IsraelGym.com and access to our archives of videos and exercise plans. Sign up today at www.israelgym.com and get ready for the new you. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hazman. Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelForceRadio.com. Back on Lewis Live, or thanks again to NBA Dave for coming on the program. Folks, we have a very special treat right now. Not as special as NBA Dave, but it's certainly up there. We're now going to play the entire Bill Belichick press conference from two days ago. This is when they picked up Tim Tebow as the quote-unquote third-string quarterback. This is June 11, 2013, so again, two days ago. Our thanks to our friends at YouTube. I have not heard this entire press conference, so I will be listening to you for the first time as well as you folks. Enjoy, and we'll have more on the other side. All right, well, we're uh, you know rolling into our fourth week here of uh, OTAs slash minicamp, and uh, 
And I feel like, uh, you know, the team's gone out there and they've done a pretty good job. Um, you know, we have another day here working the elements. And, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of this week we'll be in a uh, decent position to go into training camp. Uh, we've been installed a lot of information, a lot of our schemes, and uh, had a chance to execute them, obviously, not without pads on. So there's still a lot of work to do there. But, uh, you know, I think that for the most part we've gotten, uh, you know, good cooperation from everybody, good work on the field. Uh, definitely better than we were a few weeks ago. Um, and we've still got a long, long way to go. So just keep taking it one day at a time. But um, you know, hopefully we can finish up well this week and put things in place to have a start off through good training camp. What can you tell us about your decision to um, sign uh, Tim Tebow? I was wondering what is it about his personality or his attitude that leads you to believe that you know you can make him... Uh, we always try to... Yeah, anything we do is anything we do is what we feel is in the best interest of the team. Uh, you know, Tim's a talented player that's smart and works hard. So, we'll see how it goes. Coach, I cover politics for a TV station in New Hampshire, but I'm here today. How much of a consideration was the attention? That I'm sure you knew it was going to come with signing a Tim Tebow before making that decision. None. Try to do what's best for the team. How do you deal with um, a player coming in with all this fanfare and celebrity? Do you have to sit them down and talk to them about, you know, uh, about what they're doing? Is there any way you deal special when you get all this fuss? Uh, in all honesty, we've been in big, front of big crowds than this before. Pardon me? So in all honesty, we've been in front of bigger crowds than this before. So we'll just keep doing what our job is. We're going to try to get better as a football team individually and collectively, and that's what we're going to do. Plan to use him. What position? What position? We're gonna do what we think is best for a football team. So I don't know. We'll see. Is it possible he could be used on special teams, defense, uh, in addition to offense? Uh, we'll see. I don't know. Feel specific to his on-field traits. What are some of the things that you liked about Tim when you were evaluating him from last year and the year before that? So he's a talented guy. He's smart. Works hard. I mean, you know, we've all seen him play. He can do a lot of things. We've seen that. Specific to that, to that position, Bill, do you have an ideal number uh, when you think of the 53-man roster? No. So can you talk about your relationship with Tim? You've known him a long time. Obviously, there are things about him that you know that you like, the football player, attitude, or whatever. Yeah, no, I like Tim. I have a lot of respect for Tim. You had a close relationship over a lot of years, I understand. Is that never coached him before, so I wouldn't. Certainly closer to a lot, a lot of the players that I've coached through my career. So those people around the league who question his ability to play quarterback in the NFL, can you just say how you, how you feel about that? I think I've already said that. I've answered the question twice. He's a talented player who's smart and works hard. Discuss with him some of the ancillary stuff that seems to come with him. You know, the way the his training camp was covered last year with the Jets, all that different stuff, and what he'll be doing outside of football. Look, we we got a team full of players. Everybody's got a job to do, and I'm sure he'll try to do it the best that he can. We'll all try to do our jobs the best that we can. Team standpoint, though, I know you guys always try to eliminate distractions. Are you worried that this could cause a distraction? I mean, based just looking around at how many people are here in the middle of June. Hopefully, there'll be more than that at the games on Sunday. <laughs> Will you have any objection to Tim kneeling down and praying after he makes a big play and keyboing as it's uh, come to be known? Yeah, I think you know we've already talked enough about him. We'll see how he does and just go from there. Would, would, would you care if he does that? Because that's what he's kind of known for. I mean, do you have any objection? Are you going to tell yeah, him I think I've covered it. Pardon me? Anything else? Good. Good. Solid. Okay. He's improved every year he's been here. He's done a good job. I know Tim had a chance to work with Vinny Testaverde. I know you hold Vinny's um, opinion in very high regard. Does that weigh into this decision at all? I haven't talked to Vinny in a couple of years. Now it's entrenched as the second quarterback, or is this a situation where you can see Tim, Tim coming in and competing with him for that spot? 
right now everybody's out there just trying to learn their position, learn our assignments, and we'll let the competition go in training camp like we usually do. How much does a player bill have to learn coming in at this part of the season, June minicamp, to adapt to the system? I don't know. Is it different with every, I mean, you like to say sometimes, sometimes it's different with every I mean, We've been in three weeks of OTA, so whatever that is, that's what it is. Four weeks is four weeks. A week of training camps, a week of training camp. Regular season games, the regular season game. I mean, you know, it all adds up every day. So uh, you do the math. I don't know. Is uh, Dennard good to go? Will he be out there today after the shoulder? Uh, he'll do what he can do. How much have you stayed in touch with uh, Gronkowski over the last uh, few weeks and um, any concern about his availability to start the season? I mean, all our players except one have been here regularly through the offseason up until this week. So, we yeah, see them all on a regular basis. Are all the players here for this camp? They are. Bill, have you been thinking about this signing for a while or in the last couple of days that you thought maybe it was the right thing to do? We go through the personnel in the league on a daily basis, personnel department, and we meet periodically from time to time all throughout the year, all 365 days, basically. You had some strong words in response to a report last week saying you didn't like Tim as a player. Uh, were, you, were you upset that something was being put out there on your behalf? I don't have anything to add. Any conversations with Urban Meyer in the last 48 hours about the Tim signing? But whatever conversations I have with anybody would be between myself and that person anyway, so it's not, I don't think that's anything that would be shared publicly. There is a thought out there that Tebow is a guy who maybe just needs a couple adjustments, perhaps to thrive more as a quarterback. Do you see it that way? Have you studied him enough in that? We'll see how it goes. How much does Josh's background with Tim help, and how big a part was he of this decision? I would think that you would be part of that decision. It wouldn't There's a lot that. of people in the organization that contributed in all decisions like there usually are. Um, I couldn't put a percentage on it if that's what you're looking for. What was the general reaction? I know you don't want to talk about specific conversations, but the general reaction from Tebow's camp to get a call from you guys to say, come on up. Yeah, I don't know. You'd have to talk to them about that. But you'd have to talk to that. I kind of want to represent what somebody else said or thought. Yeah. Obviously, Tebow was available for five weeks. I'm wondering, could have got him in earlier, perhaps, and been here for the OTAs, or just didn't want to go? Well, you know, there's a lot of things in the offseason that, you know, the timing is different for one reason or another. And there are player transactions pretty much every day from the first day of free agency. Uh, and they'll. They'll be there all the way up till the end of training camp. So I think e each one's a little bit different. And, um, you know, just the way it is. Okay. Thank you. Bill Belichick, everybody. <laughs> My, the thing I like the most of the press conference, <laughs> one of the questions they asked about Josh McDaniels and his influence of Britain and Tim Tebow, Belichick says, I don't know. <laughs> How could you not know? He's under you. He works for you. Certainly you guys talked about it. You certainly know how much of an influence he had. So that was great stuff. Uh, thanks to Bill Elchek for being on Lewis Live. This was Sports Radio. We'll have more on the other side. This is Lewis Live on Israel, sportsradio.com. You're tuned in to the only all-sports talk network in the Middle East, israelsportsradio.com. Hey folks, Kagan here. As you know, I'm always staying on top of the fitness world, keeping up with current trends. One form of exercise that's been around for ages and is currently being rediscovered is suspension bodyweight training. So if you're looking for a way to get in shape, improve your health, and train your body to move in new ways, then the X1 by Israel Gym Systems is for you. Find out more on our website at www.israelgym.com or look for our page on Facebook. Israel Gym Systems X1. Israel Gym X1. Higia Hasman.
You're already using a credit card every day. Why not feel good every time you make a purchase? When using the HAS Advantage Support Israel Visa Card, a percentage of each purchase you make will be donated to your choice of 24 Israeli-based charities while still earning a reward point for every dollar spent. But wait, these rewards are even better than the standard rewards you get, especially when using them towards Israel travel with the best conversion rate on El Al's Matmid Frequent Flyer Program. Earn double points at some of your favorite supermarkets and restaurants in the U.S as well as discounts all over Israel. If you love traveling and supporting Israel, HAS Advantage is the card for you. Just give us a call toll-free at 1-866-6-ISRAEL. Sign up right now with the code ISR10 to earn 2,500 bonus points. That's 1-866-647-7235. HAS Advantage. Earn rewards. Support Israel. Offer valid for U.S. citizens only. Terms and conditions do apply. When dialing from within Israel, please dial 1-800-200-818. Israel Sports Dynamics specializes in football consulting, equipment, uniforms, and more. Great brands such as Nike, Russell Athletics, Shut Sports Products, and many more. Just one call away with over 30 years coaching experience with university and professional athletes. Harry Hill, owner of ISD, can advise you for all your sports needs. Call 054-581-3248. That's 054-581-3248. Or visit our website at www.isd. I-S-R-A-E-L dot com. If that's not easy enough, click on the ISD banner on the Israel Sports Radio website and be part of the game. Are you tired of paying for expensive gym memberships that you don't use? Are you frustrated by not seeing results? It's time for the X1. Israel Gym Systems is proud to launch the X1 Suspension and Bodyweight Training System. Lose weight, build muscle, improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. With your purchase of the X1, you'll receive a free membership to IsraelGym.com and access to our archives of videos and exercise plans. Sign up today at www.IsraelGym.com and get ready for the new you. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hazman. Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelSportsRadio.com. Back here, Lewis, live on Israel Sports Radio. Just crossed at the 7 o'clock hour. We're here until 9 p.m. local time. We have some great, great guests uh, in store. We're going to have David Dobin on. He's not been on in a while, so it'll be great to catch up with David and talk to him about the NBA Finals and Tim Tebow to the Jets and the three, the triple overtime game one of the NHL Finals between the Blackhawks and the Boston Bruins. So great stuff there. And later on, we'll have on Andy Dorf from Dorf on Sports and our good friend, Big Benjamin Bloch. Right now, we have a very special treat. Uh, we're going to bring on Ryan Fowler from Fox Sports. This interview was uh, taped, so this is not live, but he will be talking about fantasy baseball and fantasy football as well. So enjoy. And uh, once again, this is Lewis Live, Israel Sports Radio. If you listen to us on Justin TV, then go over to IsraelSportsRadio.com and click on the Store tab to check out great items such as T-shirts, hats, books, and much, much more. That's IsraelSportsRadio.com slash store. The biggest names in sports are all on IsraelSportsRadio.com. All right, on the line right now, good friend of the program and from Fox Sports, Ryan Fowler. Ryan, how you doing out there? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, doing great. It's great to have you back on the program. There is a lot of fantasy sports to talk about, both in football and baseball. It's funny because football is, for whatever reason, a 12-month-a-year sport, even though they don't play it for that long, but because it's so popular, uh, certainly it's still in the news. So let's actually get to football first in the second half of this interview. We'll talk baseball. I want to go to Joe Flacco because he comes off the Super Bowl win. Uh, he has a record for touchdowns in the playoffs, no interceptions, signs a huge contract. But that sends a lot of his teammates away, guys like uh, Anquan Boulder now at San Francisco. Ray Lewis retired, not due to a contract. Ed Reed had to go to Houston. So uh, will people think a little too high of Joe Flacco this year, and are we in or are we due for some type of slump or will he'll not have such a good season as he did last year? Well, you know, I've been really hard on Joe Flacco as a fantasy football quarterback for a few years now. I think it's one of those things where sometimes fantasy and, and, and real NFL football wins and losses, kind of there's that blurred line because fantasy football has become so big. But with Flacco, you know, I don't know if he, his, his stock's going to rise just because he went out and won a Super Bowl. He had a great run in the playoffs with the touchdowns to interception ratio. But, again, the consistency in the regular season is what fantasy football players look for. And now he doesn't have Anquan Bolden. 
Uh, and I think, again, that was a nice security blanket for him during the postseason run. He's got Torrey Smith. He has Dennis Pitta, which are some nice targets. But I think for the Ravens' offense to get, again, back into some type of flow, Ray Rice has to be a big part of it. And I don't know if that means passes out of the backfield that benefits both Ray Rice owners and Flacco owners. But I just don't see Torrey Smith and Dennis Pitta allowing Joe Flacco, anybody that takes a flyer on him, to go out there and, and put up 20 to 25 fantasy points out of the quarterback position, which is what you really need. I mean, you look at the top-tier quarterbacks in fantasy football, Rodgers, Breeze, Brady to a certain extent, and this year might be different depending on what he's got around him. But those guys are putting up 30-plus fantasy points each week, and then you have the mobile quarterbacks, Russell Wilson, Kaepernick, and, and RG3 at 100% going out there and putting 25-plus on. Joe Flacco isn't that type of quarterback, so I don't think his draft stock is going to increase because of it. Okay, now let's talk about Aaron Rodgers because Aaron Rodgers, at the time, Joe Flacco signed the biggest contract in NFL history. Then Aaron Rodgers won up to him. And there was actual talk early that the line has got to do a better job of giving him protection that in the past five years, I believe Aaron Rodgers has been sacked the most in the NFL. It was actually discussed. And Aaron Rodgers took, you know, he's the leader of the team, and he took some blame saying he's got to get the ball out quicker. I, I tend to believe, though, the line will really step up this year, and I'm looking for a big season out of Aaron Rodgers. But would you not draft him perhaps first, second round with guys like Brady and other quarterbacks out there, or would you look for Rodgers to go in the first round of a lot of these drafts? I still think he's a first-round quarterback. We actually, it, it's perfect timing. We just conducted our first fantasy football mock draft yesterday. So this is fresh, a fresh topic that we've been kicking around. And the one thing that you're going to look at when you go into a fantasy football draft this year is there's not a lot of running backs. And if there, there are, in theory, but it's part of a committee. So you're splitting carries, you're splitting touches, and one running back, you have Adrian Peterson, you have Doug Martin, you have Marshawn Lynch that are carrying the rock 20-plus times a game. But there's a lot of teams that are splitting those touches between two or three running backs. So if you go after an Aaron Rodgers in the first round, you're going to learn really quick that your second running back off the board might not be a top-tier talent. I mean, the running back twos uh, in fantasy football this year are going to be some weird names. I mean, Chris Ivory out of the Jets system this year is going to be an RB2. You're going to see Ben Jarvis Green-Ellis, who could be in a timeshare with uh, the rookie Giovanni Bernard in a timeshare. Of course, we know about the Carolina Panthers with Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams. That two-headed monster. So, again, if for those that want to draft Aaron Rodgers in the first round, and I still think he's a first-round quarterback, just be wary that, again, when you take a quarterback in the first round, your second running back is, is going to be it's going to be a headache this year because there are so many running backs by committee around the league this year. And there's a lot of running backs that, have a, uh, that are going to be running back twos that have a history of injury and might not be reliable week to week. All right, now you mentioned uh, Adrian Peterson. I want to talk about that because he had that great year, obviously, last year, winning the MVP over 2,000 yards after the ACL tear. There's been some speculation if he used some type of steroids to come back because this has never been done in sports history. And I said to people who asked that question, we will find out in the next couple of years if he took steroids or not because if he's injury-plagued, if his numbers go down, then it's an indication something happened. If his numbers stay the same, then it was all clean. So with that being said, you talked about him, you talked about the second running backs and so on. What about Adrian Peterson's status? Where do you see him going in the in the previous mock drafts, and where do you think he'll end up? I think, again, I, I just don't see, uh, even with the speculation of, of, of steroid use allowing him to come back, again, it was a freak of nature return. To shred your knee on Christmas Eve in 2011 and then come back nine months later is ridiculous. So I, I think the speculation is just out there because we've never seen it before. And, and sports has kind of brainwashed us into believing that if somebody's doing something above the norm and out of the realm of possibility, even though medicine has advanced too, uh, that steroids could, could play a role. Despite all that, he's going to be the top running back taken off the board. He's going to be the top player taken off the board. I think Arian Foster and his injury history has kind of knocked him down a few pedestals to two or three. Uh, and then I think around four or five, you see Aaron Rodgers. But, again, Marshawn Lynch is in that uh, conversation of a top five pick, Doug Martin, because, again, Marshawn Lynch, he's not splitting carries with any other running back. He might be splitting touches with Russell Wilson, but, uh, I, right. again, he's going to get – uh, over a thousand yards, and then Doug Martin, he's he, he Garrett Blunt was moved on to New England, so Doug Martin's going to be the future back that doesn't have to split touches. So, because that's such a small fraternity of players that uh, are the top running backs and not hurting in, in touches per game, uh, I think ADP will be the top player off the board. All right, now you mentioned Russell Wilson. Let's talk about the rookie class from last year. Obviously, RG3 
injury prone? Uh, will people shy shy away? Russ and Wilson, I think he's going to have a great season because last year he started the season late because he wasn't the starter right away. And I think if he played a full year, his numbers would have been even even better. And of course, you have Andrew Luck uh, taking his team to the playoffs. So discuss their roles and where you see them going in these fantasy drafts. Yeah, again, I think uh, we'll start with RG3. And again, there's a lot of, a couple question marks, obviously, coming back from a knee injury. When you are the quarterback is, is a big uh, is a big worry. Uh, he went off the board in the third round yesterday in the mock draft, so I thought it was a little bit high. I think um, the fourth round is a little bit fair for RG3. But uh, again, I don't think you're going to hear too much of uh, scoffing or argument if RG3 goes off the board uh, in, in the third round. It is interesting, though. For people that go out and draft RG3, I think they're going to be taking backup quarterbacks earlier than most teams that have somebody that they feel can play 16 games, again, those top-tier quarterbacks, because of the way that RG3 plays. You remember before the knee injury, he took a shot in the Atlanta Falcons game to the ribs, and it, it, it was almost like Michael Vick 2.0, where you have this mobile quarterback, and he's putting himself out there. So not only is the knee injury to return from, but all the type of shots that he takes if he is going to continue as this mortal, mobile quarterback uh, in the Washington Redskins offense. So I think, again, if you draft him in the third or fourth round, you're probably going to take a backup quarterback in the seventh or eighth round. Uh, but I still, again, I'm not completely against RG3. It's just you have to be careful with it. Kaepernick, I think, um, is going to – He's going to hurt a little bit just because Crabtree, is, uh, his security blanket down the stretch there, is out for most of the year with that Achilles tendon. Um, I still like Kaepernick in the third or fourth round again there. Uh, Andrew Luck, I think, is a good pick in the, in the third round. Uh, again, he, if he can stay on the same page as Reggie Wayne, they brought in Darius Hayward Bay, uh, and they still have T.Y. Hilton. And, and, again, we didn't really see much from their tight ends last year. I think Andrew Luck's a good pick uh, in that third round. They've got to get a running game going around him, though. Um, before he, he, because he could turn into Aaron Rodgers, where because there's a lack of a running attack, uh, he's out there passing uh, more times than not, and, and defenses are keying in on that uh, and, and getting to him more often than they did in his rookie year. So uh, I like Luck in the third round. Um, Russell Wilson, again, I, I think he's a guy. He fell to the fifth round, which shocked me. Again, mm. you're big on him. I'm big on him. They bring in Percy Harvin, so he has one more target to throw to. Uh, a, a very athletic uh wide receiver, slot receiver, and they can even line him up in the backfield for some option reads there, uh, which makes Russell Wilson better. So I like Wilson in the third round uh, in that draft pick because, again, going back to where all these quarterbacks are falling in the mocks and where I like them, I think you got to take running back, running back in those first two rounds or you're going to be shut out with a, a really bad running back, too. So his, it, Russell Wilson falls fifth in, in a lot of the mock drafts. In the NFL draft, he falls a third. So this is a guy, as Rodney Dangerfield said, just can't get any respect. Uh, apparently, <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. Yeah, so I, maybe when he wins a couple of Super Bowls, then people will give him a pass. I don't know. I like this guy a lot, and I love his attitude. I think he's also a team player in addition to his uh, tremendous skill. Let's uh, let's talk about the man who was second place in the MVP voting, Peyton Manning. A lot of people were concerned last year after all those neck surgeries, sitting out for a year, had a great season, put up a ton of fantasy points. He is one year older, obviously. He's in the south side of 35, as they like to say. I still feel like we're getting a good season out of him. Where has he been showing up on these mock NFL drafts? Mock fantasy draft, drafts. Well, I took him in, uh, yeah, in the mock draft yesterday. I took him in the first round as the eighth pick overall. Some people wow. in the chat room thought I reached. Wow. Again, I don't know how you can reach on a, on a quarterback that had 37 touchdowns and 11 <laughs> interceptions last year yeah. and, and threw for over, uh, for over 4,600 yards. I don't know how that's a reach. Right. Um, but I think what they were getting at was what I, I've said a few times already, where it's a reach because Doug Martin was still on the board, because another running back was still on the board. I, I think, again, Peyton Manning is a second-round quarterback only because you need that running back in the first round. So it, as great as his numbers are, I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you if you took him in the first round. Again, there are caveats to that. If it's the 10th, 11th, or 12th pick where it gets kind of dicey there towards the end of the first round, you might be able to go there and get a Manning and then on the bounce back end up with a Trent Richardson um, or an Alfred Morris or, or another running back and not completely get burned. But I think Manning's a, a great late first round, early second round quarterback uh, heading into 2013. Now, uh, a guy that we haven't talked about a lot, it's weird how this team, for some reason, goes under the, the radar. But let's talk about the Patriots. Talk about Tom Terrific last season, uh, also an MVP candidate. They went to the AFC title game. Again, because they didn't win the Super Bowl, people don't look at that as a success with the Patriots. But nevertheless, great season. 
And uh, he's still, you know, quarterbacks, many times they're in their prime at about 35 or so around Tom Brady's age. What do you expect from him? Where has he been showing up in these mock fantasy drafts? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge question mark right now. I'll tell you what. Um, with, with the Gronkowski news that has come out the last few days where he's reportedly needing back surgery and he's had the forearm injuries, and, and you look at the, the wide receivers around Tom Brady right now. He's got Danny Amendola, who was brought in basically in replace of Wes Walker, who jettisoned over to the Denver. Um, but he's got Aaron Hernandez, who is, again, returning from injury. And, and that's about it from targets. I mean, Gronkowski, we'll see if he can make it back by week one. Hernandez returning from injury. Danny Amendola, great possession receiver. Can he get in the end zone? We don't really know. So it's interesting. A month ago, I felt really confident about Tom putting up the numbers that we see year in and year out from fantasy production. Right now, I'm a, I'm a little hesitant. I don't know if I'm dodging him completely because he's, he's been able to make chicken soup out of chicken droppings in the past. <laughs> right. It's just a matter of, yeah, it's just a matter of, which chicken droppings are going to be on the field because they really don't have a wide receiver two right now. They, they cut Brandon Lloyd. They might bring him back. There's really no word on that. So that wide receiver two is kind of a glaring hole, even though they use Aaron Hernandez in wide receiver type situations, even though he's lining up out of tight end. It's just, it's a weird team around him and he has been able to do great things with that in the past. Um, but again, it could be interesting because he's getting up there in age. It'll be interesting to see how they use Steven Ridley out of the backfield. Shane Vereen, they brought in LeGarrette Blunt so he could be a vulture on the end zone. Um, but I think, again, if, if Gronkowski can play 15 out of the 16 games this year, Hernandez plays a full season and they have Amendola, I still think over 4,000 yards and 25, eh, around 30 touchdowns is feasible. It's just there's so many question marks right now. I would hate, and very few people do, to actually have a lead draft right now, not knowing what's going on in New England. All right, last question regarding the NFL. That, of course, is going to be about my Arizona Cardinals. Larry Fitzgerald sure. had, had no one thrown in the football. I probably, myself, probably could have done a better job than Mr. Skeldon. They get Carson Palmer. Carson Palmer, you know, Heisman winning trophy quarterback. We know he's got the talent. He had a bit of an attitude problem in Cincinnati, forced his way out. But he's going to actually have a target to throw to Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald will have someone to catch it from. What type of season do you expect out of Larry Fitzgerald, and where do you see him going in the fantasy drafts? Yeah, I like him a lot. Uh, Again, I think the one thing that you look at in Arizona that indirectly impacts Larry Fitzgerald is, okay, we started with quarterback. We figured out a quarterback. Carson Palmer went up to Oakland, passed for over 4,000 yards with no receiving court. So he was able, again, to use the, word, the phrase, chicken soup out of chicken dropping. So he comes down to Arizona. The one thing with Arizona last year, their offensive line was awful. A lot of the most sacks in the league, I believe, or they were top two. So you need that you need that offensive line to protect Carson Palmer to have enough time to get the ball to Larry Fitzgerald. Then it's a trickle-down effect where, again, the backfield's been kind of a mess because Deanie Wells and Ryan Williams haven't been able to stay on the field the last year. So you bring in Rashard Mendenhall, is he the answer? No, but he might be able to open up the passing game just enough to allow Carson Palmer and Larry Fitzgerald to make sweet fantasy football love on a weekly basis. I think Fitzgerald bounces back into the top four, yeah, top four fantasy wide receivers heading into 2013, uh, along with Calvin Johnson, uh, Brandon Marshall, Demarius Thomas, that group. Um, I think, again, Carson Palmer is throwing for over 4,000 yards, and Oakland was – was incredible, uh, and now that uh, Fitzgerald can make a lot of plays and help him out, I think it's a great tandem. Uh, Andre Roberts, uh, Michael Floyd, they're going to have to do their part on the other side, uh, but I think it's definitely an improved season for Larry Fitzgerald, and he gets back over a 1,000 yards and creeps close to 10 touchdowns on the season. The biggest names in sports are all on IsraelSportsRadio.com. All right, let's switch gears and go to Major League Baseball. Miguel, Miguel Cabrera potentially could get his second triple crown in a row. Right now, Chris Davis has more home runs than Miguel Cabrera. But I would imagine at the beginning of the season, most people didn't predict he would do that. Where did he go in those drafts? And at this point, is it possible that people could trade for him or is no one going to let him go because there's a good possibility that he could win another triple crown? Yeah, I mean, he was a top two pick uh, in fantasy baseball drafts this past March. Uh, can you trade for him? I, I, it's interesting. In one of uh, the leagues that I run with different fantasy writers from around the country, there was just a blockbuster trade where Miguel Cabrera was a piece of that. But the guy that got Miguel Cabrera drastically overpaid on the other side. So 
you're going to pay for Miguel Cabrera. And I don't know if a three-for-one deal benefits the, time, the, the side that's getting Miguel Cabrera. You're probably going to overpay if you go after Cabrera. I think the person that drafted him is going to hold on to him for dear life, and it's going to take a lot for him. There's always a price, and you can definitely get uh, a lot of good value for him in a trade. But uh, I think it would be kind of silly to go out and, and kind of just give him away for a dollar for a dollar. Um, with what he's been able to do on a consistent basis the last few seasons. He's helping you out in every category with the exception of stolen bases. So uh, I don't think there's a guy, maybe with the exception of Mike Trout, and he hasn't really stole that many bases this year. Uh, compared, uh, it, It's weird. Stolen bases in fantasy baseball are kind of one of those things that you can chase, and a lot of people aren't stealing bases this year like they used to. Ricky Henderson's not stealing 100 bases. So it's one of those things where – with Cabrera, you sacrifice not having the stolen bases and just feel happy with all the roto categories that you are gobbling up. Now, I'm curious. Last season, there was obviously a debate of who was the MVP, Miguel Cabrera or Mike Trout. From a fantasy perspective, at the end of the year, who would, which guy was better to have on your roster? No, that's a good question. And, again, a lot of people got into the advanced metrics, which I think is interesting because, again, um, we are going down that route where there's, there's so much information – uh, that we feel that every argument needs to be settled by uh, the advanced metrics instead of just the baseball conversation that we used to have uh, back in the 80s, 90s, 70s, and before, or whatever, uh, to sound like a radio station. But, uh, you know, I think it goes back to the 5x5 five five stats. Trout stole 49 bases, and, and his OBP, his on-base percentage, was 399. You weren't getting the stolen bases for Cabrera, so I think from a fantasy MVP standpoint, Mike Trout etched out Cabrera in that in that regard. It's interesting. I had on Dovid Dobin months ago. He actually thought it was egregious that Mike Trout did not win the MVP, and I was kind of shocked that he said that. And I said, "Why are you saying that?" You know, Miguel won the triple crown. He's like, "Well, there are other stats. Those are not the three most important stats anymore. Runs are more important than RBI, in my opinion, and on pace percentage is better than average, and so on and so on." So it is interesting that. Fantasy-wise, uh, Mike Trout could be better. However, this season, Mike Trout, you could say, is having a bit of a sophomore slump. He's under 300 two, by two points, only 10 home runs. Uh, do you think pitchers are adjusting to him, or do you expect him to have a big uh, second half of the season in, in a big June? Yeah, again, sometimes when you look at uh, stats as a whole, you get one picture. But the thing is with baseball – we call them split stats. The splits are so they, – they speak volume. So you look at Mike Trout's April, uh, 111 at bats, 15 runs, two home runs, 16 RBIs, four stolen bases. He had 261 in, in April last month. May we're, – we're tying a bow on May right now. This month he's hitting 337 with a 412 on base percentage with eight home runs, eight stolen bases, 21 RBIs, and 27 runs. The Angels offense as a whole – starting to click a little bit, so that's why the run production has moved up. But he hit for the cycle last week. I, I think the people that thought it's a slump were, were, were impressed. Or if people predicted a slump, they looked at April and were like, hey, we were right. But again, this, this season, fantasy baseball is such a marathon. Day in and day out, you're looking at your lineup. Mike Trout is not coming out of it. He's not going to have a sophomore slump. He's starting to turn it around right now. The Angels offense as a whole starting to turn it around. I feel pretty comfortable with uh, Mike Trout. I'm assuming was a top four pick in people's drafts. Uh, he's not going anywhere. All right, let's talk about his teammate Josh Hamilton. And I, I'm ashamed to say this, but I actually picked him to win the MVP because I thought in that lineup of Mike Trout and Al Pools, I thought they might, uh, you know, Mike Trout would get on base. That would be RBI potential for sure. Josh Hamilton. I thought it was logical. This is a disaster, just an absolute disaster. 219, eight home runs, 18 RBI. Uh, where did he go in the fantasy drafts? Uh, and if you, you know, if my listeners are listening and they think uh, I got to get rid of him, do you advise to trade him or to hold on to him that somehow he can pop out of this and have somewhat of a respectable season? Yeah, I think back in, in March when the drafts were taking place, uh, Hamilton shook out around the third round. Might have went in the second round in some drafts, but I think a lot of people that stayed away from Josh Hamilton knew the off the, off the field distractions and some of the, the baggage that he comes with. Right. Um, again, hitting in Texas for half the season is a lot hit, different than hitting in, in uh, Anaheim for half the season. There's there's different weather factors and conditions that uh, allow for a, the ball to jump off the bat a little bit more, and people have kind of waxed poetic about that in the past. Uh, I don't think it was a horrible pick to go third or fourth round with him uh, in drafts thinking that he was going to be producing at a much higher level uh, than what he is right now. He, he did an interview recently, and he told the reporter, and again, you never know 
what a player is going to tell a reporter in these interviews. You can go to the advanced metrics and say, he's not having a good season and come away with the same thing that he told the, the reporter where he goes, I'm just not right upstairs. So, again, it's this mental block, maybe some anxiety. He says he has trouble seeing in daylight where the, the, the sensitivity to his eyes makes it hard to hit. There's a lot of, I don't want to say excuses, but factors that kind of fall into why his numbers are so bad. I think, again, adjusting to a new team. Albert Poole has had a, had a slow start uh, with the Angels last year, too. Maybe not this slow. Um, but, again, if, you, if you're if you going to trade him, you're going to get 50 cents on the dollar, uh, and you would have to trade for somebody that had a high ceiling. I think uh, people that are looking to move Hamilton right now, um, I just don't know if uh, now is the time to do it. I, I think you're going to be selling yourself way too short. Does that mean you have to start him on a daily basis just because you drafted him third? No. I mean, if, if Giancarlo Stanton went in the first round, he's been on DL half the season, and he's on your bench indirectly. So I think mm. you could just look at Hamilton. Maybe he's hurt. Maybe he's broke. Leave him on your bench, put stream somebody else in there and kind of bite the bullet on it and wait to see if this shakes out. But to trade him right now would be um, it would be really tough to do, unless you're content with 50 cents on the dollar in value. All right, let's go to Matt Kemp. Uh, again, shame to say this, but he was my MVP pick of the NL, so I really struggle with the MVP picks this season. Something's off. This is also a bad year for Matt Kemp, not as bad as Josh Hamilton. Average-wise, 251, only two home runs, 17 RBI. Um you know, what is the reason for Matt Kemp's uh, struggles and the same – do you say the same advice? Hold on to him because you might get 50 cents on a dollar. What's your assessment of Matt Kemp? You know, it's funny. We had a conversation in the office the other day, and we're like, okay, so right now you look at Matt Kemp, you look at Josh Hamilton. If you were to, if you were to do a trade between the two parties – because, again, both are struggling. Maybe Kemp's having a little bit better of a season. Matt Kemp only has two home runs. This is yeah. Matt Kemp, two home runs. Um, who would you want? Hamilton's got eight home runs. He's got a lower batting average. And everybody unanimously decided that Matt Kemp would be the side that you'd want to come out on um, with a, a Josh Hamilton-type trade. So I think a lot of people are going out there right now because it is the end of May. They're trying to snipe off Matt Kemp as a buy-low candidate. But don't mm. sell yourself short. If you want to get rid of the headache, if it's been too much of a frustration dealing with Matt Kemp and your starting lineup, you can trade him, but do not trade for any less than 90 cents on the dollar. I think, again, he's a great buy-low candidate. A lot of owners that are, are high up in the standings, and Matt Kemp might be on a team that's a seller dweller. People are going to try and snipe him off. I think you look at him as a guy that's still worth the dollar on the dollar, but you, if, if you want to move him because it's a little frustrating, you, you get somebody a decent return uh, in an exchange, but uh, I'm not selling completely on Matt Kemp right now. All right, let's go back to the American League and talk about Robinson Cano because he's a bit of an MVP candidate with the Yankees with all their struggles. He is top five with home runs, uh, average not quite as high as the other MVP candidates, but the home runs are there. Do you imagine that when the other Yankees come back, Derek Jeter, et cetera, does his numbers go up because perhaps they have to pitch a little more carefully to him and that they can't just uh, walk him so they might give him better pitches? Or will his numbers maybe go down because he doesn't have to carry the team the way he does right now? Yeah, I think uh, sometimes Cano goes through a little bit of a slump. Again, in fantasy baseball terms, if there's Robinson Cano at second base and then there's everybody else. The talent <laughs> pool at fantasy second base is so shallow that I, I guess you could have Pedroia in the conversation this year. But you look at second base that are around the league, a bunch of them are on the DL, and nobody provides power like Cano. So I don't think in, in fantasy terms you're talking about worrying about what happens when Jeter and A-Rod and Teixeira and Uke and <laughs> Granderson, when they all come back. Yeah, I don't think it's going to impact Cano owners as much as you think just because Cano is head and shoulders above everybody else at the position. Hmm. Do I think he's going to hit over 310 by the end of the year? Yes, he's at, what, 292 right now. I think he's like a 310, 315 hitter. I think, again, he's at 13 home runs right now. If he hits 30 home runs, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this guy, he's, he's helping you in so many categories at a, at a position that does not have a lot of talent in fantasy circles and what you're trying to collect in fantasy leagues, that uh, this guy is just top-notch. And, and, again, why he became a top-five pick this year. All right, and we got to talk about Chris Davis. Can't talk about – do a segment about fantasy baseball without talking about him. If it wasn't for Miguel Cabrera, he would be in the running for the Triple Crown. Uh, first in home runs and 359 average. He's second to Miguel Cabrera and first in RBI, uh, I believe, or he is he's close to Miguel Cabrera. What is where, in the beginning? I, was this guy drafted? That I, he, he's 27 years old. Last year he did not have a, a stellar season. I say it would be good, but where did Chris Davis go at the beginning of the season with uh, fantasy foot baseball draft wise? 
You know, it's interesting. I, a lot of a lot of fantasy writers wrote about him during the preseason in February, March, and, and it was kind of funny because if you look at his entire season as a whole last year, it was it was a good season, wasn't a great season, but his August and September kind of indicated that this might be coming. Despite all that, and despite all the advice that. Again, this was a guy that people plucked off the waiver wire and just plucked him in, and then maybe they dropped him, came back at him, and it was a back-and-forth thing where he was shuffled around a bunch of different teams. Uh, his average pick was the 170th pick overall on average. Wow. So, I mean, this is a guy that a lot of people ignored. He was, he was drafted in 90% of leagues. It was just really late. Um, so I think, again, the 18th round isn't a lot of respect. And we knew he had the power numbers. I just don't think we knew that uh, the average and the on-base percentage and all the ancillary stuff were going to be there. The Orioles are clicking. That helped him. Um, and, again, this is a guy that lost. It's interesting. You look at Travis Hafner's career now with the Yankees. It's very similar to Chris Davis. He started off with the Rangers like Travis Hafner did. A lot of power numbers. It just didn't click with the batting average, and there was a lot of back and forth. So Texas kind of parted ways with him, and now he's getting a shot regular time, and this is the potential that Texas saw in him back in the early 2000s, and now it's coming to fruition with Baltimore. So it's kind of cool to see how uh, the power numbers were there early in Texas. The average wasn't there. It wasn't up to snuff. Uh, some injuries in there, and now he's now he's uh, banging it out on a, on a daily basis. So kind of a cool thing to see that an 18th rounder in fantasy circles that had a great end of the 2000. Uh, 12 season is able to continue it here uh, in 2013. Uh, quick correction on my part, Chris Davis second in RBI to Miguel Cabrera. Chris Davis with 50, Miguel Cabrera 59, but still an uh, excellent season up to this point. Last question for you. I want to talk about Justin Upton because I'm very familiar as an IMAX fan with his work. Uh, for many years, he was our best player. Sad to see him go to the Braves, but kind of happy for him because I, I had a feeling he would somewhat take off. A lot of people think the Braves are going to go to the World Series. Uh, Justin Upton, mm -hmm. part of that. Only 261 average, but he does have 14 home runs. That leads the National League at this point. Where was Justin Upton at the beginning of the draft board and any chance that you could trade for him and, and catch on the bandwagon? Or, again, will you not get good value if you do that? Um, yeah, he was taken in the third round this past March in, in fantasy drafts on average. So, I mean, it was, it was one of those things where people knew the power and, and what he was able to do with the Diamondbacks. I, I think a lot of people were kind of wondering if there was a, I don't know if there was a, a Kirk Gibson versus Justin Upton that didn't get along because it was interesting that they kind of just gave him away. I mean, right. there's obviously value that they got in the trade and all that good stuff, but it was, they, 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 got, they got him for very little. Um, and, and you look at the production that he's been able to put out, especially in comparison to his brother, who's a completely other story. Um, I, think he's, I think he's available in trade. I think the one thing you look at is because he plays the outfield and there's a lot of fantasy depth in the outfield, outfielders are easier to trade because there's, there's other options that can be plugged in there. Um, and he, he has struggled in, in May. He only has a 221 batting average in May, only two home runs this entire month after hitting 12 in April. So, again, he's kind of down right now, so maybe some anxious owners are willing to part ways with him. Um, but I, I think he'd be a guy that I would buy. If, if somebody's trying to sell well on him, uh, I would be buying low and, and definitely be happy to take him off somebody's hands. Because, again, <laughs> this guy is probably going to end up with 35 home runs uh, by season's end. Yeah, it, again, great point. It was weird to see him go. It seemed kind of easy. There wasn't a lot of complaining from Justin Upton saying, why am I traded? So perhaps there was some issues with manager Kirk Gibson. But I am happy for Justin Upton that he caught on with a good ride in Atlanta. Ryan, great stuff. That's the end of the segment. But thank you so much for being on Lewis Live and Israel Sports Radio. We'll have to have you on throughout the baseball season and certainly when football comes around, no doubt about that. I appreciate it. You take care. All right. Be well, Ryan. All right, that was Ryan Fowler from Fox Sports here on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. And we're going to stay here and not take a commercial break. We certainly appreciate Ryan Fowler's time. But this is a big NBA final special. we got to get on as many people as we can to break down the final series. Game four is tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern time, which means four in the morning for us Israelis here in Israel. Game four, pivotal game. Spurs trying to go up 3-1 to one in the series. The Heat trying to even up the series at two games apiece. LeBron James still has not called, excuse me, LeBron James has not gotten to 20 points this series. Kind of scary. Talk about the four-time MVP. Four MVPs in five years. Very well could have won five MVPs. Derek Rose got the other MVP. And on the line right now to help us figure out what's going on with the NBA Finals, our good friend David Dovid. David, welcome back to Lewis Live at Israel Sports Radio. Ari, it's been way too long. How have you been? 
Uh, do great. It certainly has been too long, so let's jump right into it. I just mentioned this, that LeBron James has not scored 20 points yet in this series. Is this a case where LeBron is getting a bit of stage fright or the Spurs doing something, some type of containment where they keep him out of the paint, they keep him away from the free throw line, and that's why LeBron has not gotten a 20 points yet? You, you know, there, to blame this on LeBron becoming small is to ignore two things. A, that we just saw 12 months ago that he can carry a team to the title, and B, it's an insult to Greg Popovich. It really is. This is a guy who, you know, for everyone who overlooks Tim Duncan's greatness, and that's the storyline, right? Everyone wants to talk. Whenever the Spurs make the finals, people want to create this storyline of the boring Spurs led by their boring superstar. As much as Tim Duncan is overlooked, Greg Popovich is, I'm not sure if he's better than Phil Jackson, but in the post-Bulls era for Jackson, he and Popovich, if Popovich wins this title, they've each got five. Um, I I give full credit to Popovich for de- des- designing a game plan to basically force LeBron into a distribution role. People have been knocking LeBron for his unwillingness to shoot. I call it his wisdom to not take stupid shots. He gets out there. He's shooting under 50%, but rather than keep chucking, He's trying to trust his teammates. Unfortunately, his teammates have not shown up in this series. All right, let's go to something earlier in the season. Very foreshadowed that perhaps, who knows, but there was that famous game where Popovich thought that it was not fair the way the scheduling was set up to travel, to have four games or five days, whatever have you. He did not send his main guys to Miami. Uh, Was that thought of that we might play some in the NBA Finals. We're going to play a little bit of gamesmanship. We're going to, and they almost won that game, the Spurs did. That was on national TV, and Popovich and the Spurs were fined $250,000. Uh, how much is that still remembered now in the NBA Finals? You know what? If anything, I'd say the fact that he made that move made these finals even more, you know, unpredictable. They did that in Miami. The Heat then came into San Antonio later in the season and pulled the same stunt sat LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. And because of those, because of that gamesmanship, these two teams came in with a completely clean slate into the NBA Finals. Um, it gave the Spurs, who I'd have to assume that even as the Heat went seven games, they were probably banking on facing Miami and had nine days to install an anti-LeBron uh, game plan, whereas the Heat only had two, three days to prepare for the Spurs. And I think more than anything, that right there is where Popovich got to execute his vision, got to work with his players on uh, figuring out how you're going to stop the greatest player in the NBA right now. All right, that certainly is a factor. Great point as well. Spurs able to get the sweep in the conference finals against the Grizzlies and the long, brutal series against the Pacers and their physical play. Uh, let's talk about the guys that need to step up. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, was Bosch severely overrated? He was called one of the big f- three. He's getting $15 million like the other two guys. This guy is basically a jump-shooting big man. Is, is there something else we're missing, or did the Heat perhaps overpay or overhype this guy? Well, they definitely overpaid. I don't think he deserved the max money. I don't at all put him in the same, uh, on the same level as Wade and certainly not as LeBron. But Bosch in Toronto, he had this jump shot, but he also was a traditional power forward. That's what made him such a weapon. He could work down low and he could space you out from 18 feet. Spolstra, who, by the way, I mostly, I think Eric Spolstra has been brilliant in making this team work, designing offensive schemes to make all the talent fit perfectly. The one thing he has done wrong is completely misuse Bosch. Asking him to become more of an outside player, while that does fit his abilities, I think he's asked him to do even more. I mean, we've seen Bosch shoot four three-pointers in a game, in game one of this series. That's not his game. He's a 28% career free uh, shooter from beyond the arc. He is good from 18 feet. And if you're using that in concert with his ability to bang down low, 
then you're using him right. But I think that ability has basically atrophied as basic as Spolstra for these last couple of years has basically told Bosch not to bother working under the basket. And I don't know if he told him tonight, you know what? I want you working against Duncan and Splitter. I don't think he's capable of it anymore. I think those skills have basically atrophied as he has been completely miscast in this series. All right, let's go now to Tony Parker's questionability. Uh, banged up in game three, got about 27 minutes, only scored six points. He said he's ready to go several times. Uh, what do you think about his health? I mean, Parker um, was, is not necessarily known as a guy that plays with a lot of injuries because he hasn't had a lot of injuries, really. So how do you think he'll respond tonight in game four? What do you expect out of the Spurs point guard? You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what his health is like. He may be ready to play. He may be fine. I mean, he didn't he, – he was – he basically got the best diagnosis possible. If you're going to have this hamstring issue, a grade one strain is as good as you can hope for. And if he was able to recover, then I don't see any reason he should be slowed down. But if he is, I mean, Parker is the one who makes that offense go. Yes, Tim Duncan has is, is a weapon in the post. And you got Green and, uh, and Leonard bombing away from outside and then Gary Neal even coming off the bench and doing that but if Parker is not at full strength not able to draw the defense with his penetration or just the threat of his penetration it suddenly allows the heat to stay out on the perimeter players just a little bit more the heat in fact we've seen it before this is a team that their three-point defense is generally very impressive uh, what the Spurs did, I mean, first of all, how you can – that, that three-point shooting was a completely uh, off the reservation. There's no way that should ever happen again. But even the fact that they were getting those open looks is a testament to Parker's ability to break down a heat defense that is usually able to stay out on the perimeter. And if Parker is in any way mitigated by this injury, it severely limits – well, it, it, it drastically limits what the Spurs can do. All right, let's talk about Duncan's play because Duncan had 20 points in game one, but since then he scored 12 and 9 respectively. The Spurs are up 2-1, so that's a bit under the radar. But what is Duncan, if the Spurs are going to win tonight and take a 3-1 lead, how many points does Timmy need to pour in for that to happen? Well, you know what? I think, again, that comes down to the Spurs having needed Duncan to contribute. You know, in game three, he came out early. He was their offense for the first few minutes. And now what happened is, again, the outside shooting started working. And when you've got that touch going, when, De when De Danny Green is hitting seven of nine, you don't need to go to Duncan. You know, I, I think Popovich understands. I mean, we've seen it before with Duncan, that Duncan in certain games has been minimized this year. He hasn't put up his usual numbers because he's been used a little less. And I think the Spurs, this is the foundation of their success. They're not going to force the ball into situations that aren't optimal. And even though you'd think giving the ball to Duncan, who still, when he gets his touches, is as effective as ever, while he is certainly a dangerous weapon, when you're beating the Heat by bombing away, there's no reason to force the ball into Duncan. Yes, he has struggled with his field goal percentage a little bit, and some credit has to go to Miami's defense for that. But I think the Spurs are content to let him settle for 9, 10 points if they're getting the offense from elsewhere. We're on the line right now with David Dobin. David, uh, let's take a little bit break of the NBA Finals. We'll still talk the NBA. I want to get your thoughts on Jason Kidd uh, coaching the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Kidd just recently retired, played last year with the Knicks. And as I've talked about, he's a bit of a bonehead. Had the DUI last year with the Suns, had the domestic violence abuse, and he had other issues with his wife while he was a member of the Nets. Very, very public about that. Flipped out the fans in Phoenix when he returned. I don't really – he's a point guard and a great point guard, so in that aspect, I see him as a good coach. But personality-wise, I think he's a little too immature for the job. Give us your thoughts about him being the head guy in Brooklyn. I think it would have been a spectacular idea – to bring him in as an offensive, as a top offensive assistant. Um, the fact that Kidd is being brought in with Lawrence Frank, his old coach with the Nets, as his assistant, 
it's basically a confession by the Nets and by Kidd that he simply, look, uh, what was it? A week ago, a week ago, he was still officially a member of the Knicks. A month ago, he was missing fast break layups in the playoffs. This is, I, I, it's unprecedented to say the least. And it, it, as far as we know, I mean, we'll find out more. He'll speak to the media in about an hour, 15 minutes. But as far as we know, this entire process started four days ago. And for it to so rapidly go from, oh, how nice. They're going to give their old superstar. They're going to give him the courtesy of an interview because he's interested. To finding out on Tuesday that he blew Billy King away. And then yesterday, it's a done deal. Something reeks here. I, I, I get the feeling, again, seeing as they have basically admitted that this guy is not ready to take on all the duties of head coaching. This reeks of marketing. This feels to me like a move that was made not necessarily because of his basketball acumen so much as the idea that they're bringing in the face of their New Jersey days, trying to bring over some of the fans who may not have crossed state lines when they moved to Brooklyn and maybe even steal away just a few more fans as they try to take a larger foothold in the city that is obviously dominated and will be dominated for many years to come by the Knicks. This isn't going to make a dent uh, in the Knicks' ownership of New York, but I think that's the intent, to try that. Um, Kid, about the only positive to this is his relationship with Darren Williams, which has been described as a brotherly relationship where Kid is basically Darren's mentor. But even that, it makes you wonder what's going to happen when Darren needs to be pushed a little bit, mm-hmm. when when kid needs to put some pressure on his star point guard. I, again, just the very fact that kid has absolutely no experience in the day to day operations. I, I, I used this this analogy on my show last night. It's almost like you're taking a guy who's been working in, say, the IT department of a company. And he decides he wants to get more into the management side. And yes, his computer skills will serve him well there, but he has no real management experience. And instead of moving him over as, say, a vice president of, uh, say, a vice president of technology, you're making him the CEO of the company. And just the fact that he never had that training in management, that he's basically skipped the entire ladder and just climbed right to the top, it doesn't seem the most prudent move. It, it just doesn't seem like he's had any of the experience necessary to truly understand what it is like to be a leader, not just in the locker room, but from an office as well. All right, former Nick Jason Kidd becomes a head coach. Former Nick, who's been retired for a lot longer, paid his dues for a lot longer, Patrick Ewing. Looks like he's going to get the assistant job with the Bobcats. Of course, this where Michael Jordan is uh, one of the owners of the team. Is that If you're Ewing and you see the story, do you say, hey, what is going on? How come I can't get a head coaching job? And this guy did it without paying the dues. So if, how upset are you if you're Patrick Ewing right now? I think you're upset, but I think you also might finally come to the realization that there's a reason you haven't gotten the job. And look, I can't, I don't know this for a fact, but if he's been, he's been around this long, I mean, he's been bouncing around as an assistant coach, always supposedly the head coach and waiting for whatever team he's with. The fact that he has yet to get the job, maybe people around the league are just not all that impressed by him. Yeah, It, it could very well be. That And, you know, again, the thing with Kidd is everyone assumed or part of it is great player. Does he make a great coach or not? I don't think there's any steadfast rule that. And I think a lot of Ewing's supposed coaching uh, credentials were coming from the fact, hey, look, this guy was the face of the Knicks. He was a franchise leader. Of course he can coach. And I don't there's no basis to that. He's had this. He's had, as, as I mentioned, with Kidd not getting it. He's had all these years to learn the ropes as a, a in management, and clearly he has yet to impress people enough to climb that ladder. 
So maybe at this point, Ewing thinks to himself, maybe I'm never going to get this chance. Or maybe he commits himself to figuring out what exactly he needs to fix, takes feedback from the interviews he hasn't succeeded with, and maybe this motivates him even further. Maybe, maybe he thinks to himself, that's it. This is the last straw. If kid can get this job and I'm still here, clearly I need to work on myself. And maybe while in, while in Charlotte, he figures it out. He, he figures out um, how he's going to go about becoming a head coach. Now, this coach at Carousel, very interesting. This is a record this season, and that 12 coaches have been let go. Six of them took their team to the NBA playoffs. One of them is the reigning coach of the year in George Carl. What the heck is going on? Do these owners and the fans of the franchises, are they just too impatient? I mean, with Carl... Carl is one of the greatest coaches of all time, numbers-wise. They don't ever won a title. Six-winning coach of all time. Uh, great record. They lost in the first round. But, uh, I mean, what's going on exactly that these – I mean, 12 NBA coaches, that's uh, uh, that's over a third of, of the NBA. What, what's going on that all these coaches keep getting fired? Well, you know, the Carl, the Carl situation was very weird. It was he basically – off coach of the year, he went to his bosses and said, I want a raise or I want an extension. And his bosses, who are all new because Masayuhiri, the wonder kid who really fleeced the Knicks in the Carmelo Anthony trade, he left back to Toronto, where he originally started as an assistant. He's now taken over as their general manager. And with the new management in place in Denver, I'm not sure what their thought process was, but when Carl came and asked for for an extension, uh, he has one year left on his deal. And when he asked for a little more job security, they would not give it. And officially, he was fired. I don't know. That might have been one of those, we'll fire you so you could get your severance deals, that you don't have to resign. But the fact that they would not give him the extension is the reason he's now on the market. And the question I have is, and again, this goes back to Jason Kidd and his search, his appearance with the Nets. Why is George Carl not getting interviews? I, I, I'm, I'm baffled by it. This is a guy that I would have wanted the Nets to look at. Um, it's a guy that I think every team should be looking at. Between him, Jerry Sloan, maybe not as much. He he had this one team that he was with for 20 years, and maybe some teams aren't all that impressed by his system. But you see George Carl and how he's gone around the league, succeeding everywhere he's gone. How is he not? And again, he he is the NBA reigning NBA coach of the year. How is he not getting any interviews? How is he not at the top? Of most lists. Uh, he's one of my favorite coaches ever, and, and I'm a Suns fan, and we had to deal with him when he coached in Seattle, but uh, what he did with Gary Payton and Sean Kemp and that team and went to the NBA Finals, that team that lost to Jordan 96, I think any other year would have won the title. They just ran into the 72-win team Bulls. So I'm a big, big fan of George Carl. In the few minutes we have left with you, before we go to the NBA Finals, we have to ask you about Tim Tebow. Wouldn't be doing my job if we didn't. Tebow last year with the Jets, that was a disaster. That doesn't work out. Bill Belichick thinks he can get it done with Tebow. What do you expect out of Tim Tebow this season? And is this a carnival move, or does Belichick really want to do something with Timmy? Okay, Belichick does not do carnival moves. If <laughs> right. Belichick made this move, and, and you know what? Honestly, again, I believed in the Jets. When they made the trade last year, I believed they would actually use him correctly. They didn't. But I believe Belichick understands, and he's made it very clear. He was asked, what position will he play? He would not at all say the word quarterback. He's been practicing as quarterback the last few days. But basically, the way I see this move is they signed him, gave him absolutely zero guaranteed money while locking him into a two-year deal that basically gives them all the leverage if they could figure out a way to use him. And if there's anyone who can make something out of this guy, it will be Belichick. He's the guy who will be able to find the position at which he can actually contribute. And if Belichick cannot find anything for him to get, to do, offense or even on defense, whether as a running back, a tight end, a linebacker, I don't know what Tebow is actually capable of. I can tell you that it's not throwing the ball effectively as an NFL quarterback. But if there's anyone who can figure out how he's ever going to produce, it's Bill Belichick. And if with the zero guaranteed money, I would not be completely surprised if Tebow was off the roster by opening day. Wow. 
Yeah, I, the right. I, this was a, and you could see it in the very fact that he made that. That's the contract he signed. Belichick is making absolutely no commitment to him, nor should he. And this is Tebow's last chance. And and even more so, I'll say this: I think Tebow is only getting this shot because he is Tim Tebow. What Belichick is doing is he sees a guy. A 6'2", 236 pound athlete. And he's saying, you know what? A guy with that physical, with those physical attributes should be able to produce something for an NFL team. The only thing separating Tebow from any other physical specimen like that who's out on the street is that Tebow is in the NFL. He's a member of the NFL PA. That you wouldn't have to draft him. You know, the that he's just there. It's basically not so much what you can do as much as who you know, what circles you're already in. I honestly think that's the way Belichick views him. Belichick basically views him as a raw, as a raw physical athletic specimen with whom, for whom he will try to mold into a productive football player. I do not believe anything Tebow has done in the past will matter one iota to Belichick. All right, wow. So a prediction possibly... Tim T would not be on the roster when opening day comes. If that happens, is his NFL career done? Now this is two teams in a year that said he can't play football. Is he done in the NFL if he doesn't make it with the Patriots? Absolutely. That, 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 that's my basic premise. If Belichick cannot figure out what to do with him, nobody will. Wow. All right. Okay, last few minutes with you. What happens tonight? Do the Heat tie up the series, and are we looking for a long seven-game series, or do the Spurs go up 3-1 and look to clinch this thing on Sunday? Give us your thoughts. Well, I'll say this. If Parker is not at peak efficiency, uh, it pretty much gives the Heat this game because, you know, it's funny. After game one, I expected the entire series, whether it be a sweep or a seven-gamer, that all four games would be that good. And then what do we get? We get two blowouts either direction. So I've been quite a bit surprised by what we've seen so far this series. But I'll say that the two teams are still evenly matched. Uh, if Wade and Bosch are at all productive, and by the way, let's not ignore that Chalmers and Haslam got shut out, zero points each, and these are starters in game three. Um, but assuming, and this is a really stretchy, this, this assumption is not a safe one, assuming Wade is somewhat Wade-like and Bosch can produce something, these two teams are very evenly matched, and a Parker injury would basically seal the deal for the Heat. As it is, I still think the Heat are the better team if everything is operating at at its best. If they're all at their best, the Heat are a better team. However, tonight, if Parker is hurt, I'd give the Heat the easy win. But long term, for the course of the series, I can no longer... And, and I, by the way, I've been saying all year that a Heat title is an inevitability. With Dwayne Wade no longer, Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh now basically just Anderson Varajal and Baron Davis. <laughs> right. It's 2007 Cleveland all over again, and I don't see any way that the Heat can win. Uh, kind of scary. Uh, tr- yeah, I mean, when they were 43 and, and 3 or whatever that, that streak was, you know, I, I've told everybody, go, it, this is a foregone collusion to go win the title. It's a formality. And even if the Heat win tonight, you know, now you go 2 or 3, so it's not for sure. So. Very, very surprised. Usually don't see quote-unquote upsets in the NBA Finals. Uh, I know, I believe Vegas had the Heat uh, a favorite, so this would be technically an upset, but some people uh, not so much. Dovid, great to have you on. It has been too long. Dovid Dovid of New York and Philly's MTR Radio. Thank you for being on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio, and we will be in touch. All right, all right. Take care. Be well. David Dobin here on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. We're going to stay here and not take a commercial break because it's just that type of show. We have to get everything in as, uh, as time will allow, if you will. I will. Basically, you could do a show like this for five hours and still, still not touch on everything. So many things going on. Uh, so we have two hours in the books, one more hour to go. A great uh, guest lineup so far. We had on Andy Gershman, author of Modern Day Maccabees. We had on Ryan Fowler from Fox Sports, NBA Dave, David Dobin from MTR of New York and Philadelphia. We're going to now go to our next guest. This gentleman, as you'll find out when he comes on, is not that surprised the Spurs are up 2-1. Before the series started, he told me personally on my cell phone that the Spurs could sweep 
That's right. The Spurs could sweep the heat if it's all LeBron James. And on line right now to validate his sensational prediction of Spurs dominance, Big Benjamin Block. Big Benjamin Block, welcome to Lewis Live in Israel Sports Radio. Hey, right. Great to be on. Great to be on again. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So uh, you, you called this before the series started on my cell phone. You thought the Spurs are the better team. They would dominate. Did you expect that type of blowout, though, in Game 3? No, I, I think that um, a record-setting three three point spree is not going to occur every night. Um, a shutout kind of defense being pitched is not going to occur night in, night out. I expected them to win, and I expected them to respond. Um, I, I think that when you look at how the Spurs handled their game two loss and their post game and their press conferences and interviews, it was very, very different from the Heat in that the Spurs looked like, you know what, we got sloppy with our passes, we're okay. Uh, when you look at the way Miami responded, it was like they, they, they didn't know what to do. It was a soul searching moment for them, and it, it's actually quite possible that that's the wake-up call that as a team they need. Uh, in terms of how they match up, you know what? The Spurs are just as talented, just as deep. And by the way, they are a 58-win team in a much stronger Western Conference. Great so point. I, I don't think that Miami is as dominant an opponent versus the Spurs as they have been over – uh, their fellow Eastern Conference teams in the playoffs. Well, you know, one of the things we knew from top to bottom, the Spurs were a better team. I don't think a lot of people really disagree with that. But this dominant, Lee, uh, Green and Leonard, and, I mean, you go on and on, um, Gary Neal, they're, they're just that much better than what the Heat have to offer. Also, you talked about this, that if other guys outside LeBron James are not going to step out, the Heat can't win. So what exactly is going to happen? I mean, Dwayne Wade is 31, an old 31 He's not going to be the guy of six, seven years ago in the finals. Chris Bosh is overrated. I don't know. How can the Heat pull this around? If you're a Miami Heat fan, or you're speaking to the Miami Heat fans, what can you say to them of what they need to do to pull this around? Um, they need to hit open shots. It's plain and simple. Um, even LeBron, he's being, you know, he's being left open from the outside. A lot of these guys are being left open from the outside. When you look at Miami opening up that run in game two, Mike Miller and Ray Allen went on a tear. You know, just an assassin-style shooting spree. They're going to have to hit outside shots because, quite frankly, San Antonio has been more than happy to give it to them. I think that Eric Spolestra is going to have to mix up the lineup, and he may have to do the unthinkable and go long stretches without LeBron on the floor. Um to throw the Spurs out their game. There was a stretch in game three in the, I'm trying to remember, it was the late second quarter, early third quarter, where he took the run out for, I don't know, a four-minute stretch, something like that, where the Heat actually played much better because the rest of these guys decided that it was time for them to step up. It was time for them to make plays. It was time for them to score. It was time for them to play D because they, they, they've fallen into a pattern of relying on LeBron, and, you know, Pop's got LeBron figured out. The Spurs' defense has LeBron figured out. There, there, There is nothing, in spite of just how great of an athlete and a player LeBron is, that is going to allow him to single-handedly take this series. All right, now one of the things... But when you throw in, you throw in on a floor where he's not on there, well... Who do you guard? You don't move a double team. You don't stack one side of the floor where LeBron is. All of a sudden, you're left with a whole bunch of one-on-one matchups. You're left with opportunities for Dwayne Wade to really make it to the hole. Mario Chalmers loves to make those plays. Um, where they can set screens up top for Mike Miller, Ray Allen, start knocking down threes, setbacks. 
um, just a whole slew of opportunities by spreading the floor and by not allowing the Spurs to just focus their entire defense around one guy. All right, but the, since they have done that, this is my question. I mean, I know the Spurs had nine days. They came off the sweep of Memphis, and Miami had to go seven games against the Pacers. But the Heat have been dominant throughout the year. James has been dominant throughout the year. They had that stretch 44-3. and three. How come the other teams couldn't figure out how to keep LeBron James under 20 points for three games in a row? The other teams aren't the San Antonio Spurs. Um, you know, if you look back, there was that famous fine that Popovich received for not suiting up. I think Tim Duncan and Tony Parker. Right, and the national televised game. Totally, and the nationally televised games. Uh, it was a t- game in Miami. Right. Popovich, um, they really wanna, haven't yeah. seen this Spurs team. They haven't seen a team like that. Um, they haven't seen a team with that kind of basketball IQ, with that kind of experience. Uh, they play in a much weaker division in the weaker of the two conferences. Uh, so they've, they've played games where one guy can take over. And when you play the Spurs, the Spurs are the epitome of team basketball. They They are not the ESPN highlight reel that most people focus on. And to be quite frank, you know what? LeBron said coming into this series that he has wanted revenge on the Spurs. He has want, like this is something that has been on his mind. So I think there is something psychological in his head uh, about playing the Spurs. And it, this is not to take away from uh, Kawhi Leonard's defense on him or any of the Spurs, but. You know, he could very well be hallucinating and see Bruce Bowen's head <laughs> on Kawhi right. Leonard's body. Right. Like, uh, that was that scene in Waterboy where Adam Sandler was seeing their coach's head on the opposing team's players. <laughs> right. And I'm not, I'm not going to go that far to say it, but there, there is something that may subconsciously be kind of rocking LeBron James' psyche. Hmm. And this isn't really to diminish from LeBron James. LeBron James has been doing – exactly what he should be doing he is playing defense he's grabbing boards he's getting assists giving his teammates open looks that's what he has to do there, there's just no questions asked and you know I, I you hear all the nba pundits say no he has to do this himself well he can't do it himself the whole reason that he is in a miami heat basketball uniform is because he doesn't want to do it himself. Right. He doesn't want to be Michael Jordan. He wants to be Scotty Pippen. Ooh, ouch. Uh, we're on the line right now with Big Ben from the block. Home LeBron hit Scotty Pippen. Well, let's talk about LeBron's mental capacity because you might have a point there since he is thinking about when the Spurs beat him and his Cavs six years ago and LeBron's mental focus or his scare, uh, being scared to take the final shot, all these different things have come into play in the past. We thought it was over after he won the title. We thought he had a sense of freedom. Is that not ended? Is that is he still not the killer like a Kobe or a Michael Jordan? I think it's possible. Um, I think that sometimes every, every player, irregardless of sport, has a few teams that they don't play well against. True. And this, true. this this for LeBron James might be one of those teams. It, 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 maybe it is that team. Um, you know, when you look at what San Antonio did by daring him to shoot jump shots in 2007, we'll go back and look at game film. 2013, they're daring him to shoot jumpers, and supposedly he had developed his jumper, and he did. He shot I think over 50% from uh, the field this season, sometimes 60%. But all of a sudden, he has reverted back. And and to be quite frank, I wouldn't even take all of this out on LeBron. I I really wouldn't. It has to be a team effort from Miami. It's not going to be him versus them. He just can't play one on five. As good as he is, he can't play one on five against the Spurs. He knows it. Um, uh, you know, I, I just think it's possible that his teammates don't. Um, 
you know, they've become so reliant on just kind of, you know, kicking back, hitting a few open threes, taking some layups when they get the chance, but, you know, just kind of letting LeBron do everything. And you know what? LeBron is tired. That series against Indiana was taxing on him. It was. Chicago mugged him. Um, to be quite frank, the effort that he has to put in on defense against the Spurs, between stretches on Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili, who run around the floor like Speedy Gonzalez, and having to help out against Tim Duncan in the post, that's wearing him down. Um, before the series started, they asked, well, will LeBron James guard Tony Parker? And the answer consistently was, maybe for stretches at the end of the game because it would just wear him down. He was getting worn down by having to play defense. And I don't know if Eric Lester is just going to be like, you know what, don't bother with playing defense. <laughs> you know, don't, don't bother with any of that. I, I don't think that's something he's going to do. I think that. Le- LeBron is one Lester of the best defenders smart. in the league. You can't have him not play defense. Uh, that's for sure. Now, I want to ask you, we're talking about this Pacers series going seven games. Did they expose something with the Heat? They could have, I don't want to say easily won the series, but game one was a buzzer beat a shot. So if that goes the other way, that he could have won that series in six or seven games. Did that expose something that the Spurs have picked up and are using for the NBA Finals? Absolutely. Post-presence is everything. Uh, Turnovers is everything. You want to know why Miami won the series against Indiana? Miami won the series against Indiana because Indiana turned the ball over way, way, way too much and allowed Miami to get into its transition game. Um, Even the last game, in fact, San Antonio actually turned the ball over, I think, 16 times, maybe maybe 14 times, maybe a few less. But in that game, too, it was turnovers that allowed Miami to win. If Indiana doesn't make all those turnovers, you know, and I'm not even going to epitomize this to saying that if Frank Vogel doesn't make a really poor substitution choice with a second to go, or 2.5 seconds to go in game one. Not having Roy Hibbert. Indiana Indiana wins that series. Um, I think that's the big thing they learned, and they learned, you know what? Don't let LeBron get to the rim. And you know what? Don't foul him. If you you play between him and the basket, if you stick your hands up, if you're in his face but not on him, He's going to miss shots. He's used to being able to play an open floor game. He's either used to getting hacked or, you know, having a wide open pass. All right, one, um, of, one of the things, uh, you know, as a, if you're a Spurs fan out there listening, how happy do you have to be that the Spurs are up 2-1, Duncan has not had a great series. He's only scored 20 points once. He's at 12-9. and nine. Parker was injured in game three, only scored six points. You know, the, the Stars have not had a great series, and they're still up 2-1. How happy would, as a Spurs fan, do you have to be when you realize that? Um, I, I don't know if it, it's something to really be that happy about. There's still a lot of basketball left to be played right now. I don't think that uh, anybody who's watched this team play, who's watched the Heat play, know that they they got this, like this is locked up, because it's not. But I think it feels good. I think that being able to come back off the loss they did, that they had in – in Miami and playing like that is just huge. Um, and, you know, role, role players are the hallmark of championship teams. You know, you go back and find me a championship team that didn't have good role players because one does not exist. Um, you got all your six man. You've got your young guys who step up to the challenge. You've got a new hero night after night. And that's really, that, 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 that to me would be the real high point if I'm a Spurs fan. I don't know if I'm totally satisfied. If the Spurs win tonight, then I'm really ecstatic as a Spurs fan because, quite frankly, if the Spurs win tonight, it, it's over. Maybe Miami gets one desperation win 
the following game. But there's no way that they win this series. You know, they don't win tonight. Right. You don't see the Heat winning th- uh, three games in a row. Do you see any team? Their confidence is just it's rattled. All right. Now, um, be- before we continue with this NBA Finals as far as uh, what will happen, I- one of the things I want your opinion on, if the Heat do lose, that means LeBron James, with his four MVPs, has only one title in four attempts to the NBA Finals, meaning he's lost three of them. He's not 30 years old yet. What would his legacy be? Would, it, would we start calling him a Wilt Chamberlain? Wilt Chamberlain only won one title. Uh, and does his legacy severely, severely get damaged if they lose this season in the NBA Finals? Could be. I think that he made his biggest tarnish on his legacy when he made the decision in the fashion it was made, when he turned his back on his hometown fans, when he said, you know what? I don't want to have to be a superstar. I want to be a good starter. I think that's when he really wrecked his legacy. You and think when, LeBron... when we talk about this in 15 to 20 years, I think that's something that people are going to talk a lot more about than they do now. You don't think he's a superstar, I, Big I, Ben? I, yeah. he, he's won two MVPs since he left Cleveland. Obviously, he's still the best player in the league. He's not just a good starter. He's still a superstar. But the reason he left Cleveland is so that he didn't have to be. That the fact that he's gotten two MVPs uh, has been perhaps accidental as a result of the tremendous athlete and the tremendous player that he is. But that wasn't his intention. Wow. His intention was to win championships. MVPs, if you ask him, I'm willing to bet you that he would trade all of those MVPs for championships. Wow. Interesting stuff. That so- wasn't his intention. His intention was not to be Wilt Chamberlain, to, to average uh, 50 points, double, triple double, night in, night out. His intention was to win a championship. He could have done that playing for Cleveland if he just wanted to average those numbers. All right, let's talk about then the Heat supporting cast in the future, especially if they lose this series. I've said this several I'm going to keep saying this. Wade's an old 31. Chris Bosh is overrated. They don't have much of a supporting cast going forward. I don't know if LeBron could, could win the championships he wants to win, the amount he wants to win with the supporting cast. What would happen in the future for Miami if they lose this season to the Spurs? You know, it may not actually necessarily be who's on the court. If I'm Pat Riley and they lose this series, I'm bringing Eric Spolestra into my office, telling him to sit down and then stand up and get out. (laughs) Wow. And by that, I mean get out of town because the only reason that Miami has been to three finals and won one is because of how talented the big three are. Go back and watch this series. You're going to see Miami's assistant coaches standing and shouting more than you'll see Eric Spolestra. He hasn't really had to do a whole lot of coaching. He's relied purely on just how talented these guys are. I wouldn't be surprised to see Pat Riley go out and start taking Phil Jackson out to fancy dinners, Um, Doc Rivers, uh, just a whole slew of older, more seasoned coaches who really coach. Uh, I think that I would start there if I was Miami. Wow. So you think Spolester is out if they lose the series? Well, I mean, they're the Spolestra is Pat Riley's boy. Right. He's been with the organization at, like, bottom up. But I think that he's being outcoached right now at a championship level. If he has gone three seasons in a row to the finals and won one, and by the way, that one was against a zombie Sonics team that I think was cursed with basketball karma. <laughs> uh, well said. But, but, but it will be because they have been out coached, out strategized. Because the whole the way they play is basically it a you know let let the players do all the thinking. And then you're playing in the NBA finals. You're playing deep in the playoffs. That's when 
all these plays that coaches draw up. That's when the coach's ability to motivate his players to start to assert some semblance of control over his team really comes in. And right now, you want to talk about like, the biggest reason, perhaps, that the Spurs are up to one? Sure. It's Lay it up. coaching matchup. It's because your coaching matchup is Greg Popovich, who has probably been around the game longer than Eric Spolester has been alive, is just a far superior coach. I think that's where you start if you lose this series. Wow. All right. Now, Greg Popovich is a great coach. If Doc Rivers was the head coach or Phil Jackson, you're saying they can outcoach Greg Popovich in the NBA Finals. I don't know if they can outcoach him. Well, Phil Jackson might be able to. I think they have to make a move for a real big man, big man. Um, Sosh is not a big man, big man. They don't play Birdman enough, quite frankly. It absolutely baffles me after seeing what Birdman does on the floor and how much time he plays. Why on earth he isn't playing 30 minutes a game in his NBA Finals? They don't have a good, real big man. They have Joel Anthony on the bench, but he's not good. They need a big man who's going to be a big man. Zonis Haslam is about three inches too short and not nearly the athlete. But they need a big man. They need a, I don't know, a Roy Hibbert kind of guy. They need um, Channing Fry. Uh, just they need a real big man to shore up the middle. The thing is, though, there aren't that many big men in the league. I mean, you mentioned two of them, but are there that many more? And Roy Hibbert ain't going anywhere. He'll be in Indiana for a long time. If the Pacers are smart, they'll keep him as long as they possibly can. Maybe they're just – it's not the game anymore. The days of Shaq are over, and it's much more European. It's much more six eleven center types. Maybe those days are over. That's possible, but even with the six eleven types, okay. Look at Tim Duncan. Look Do you, at the type of player that he is. Is it, is it Tim Duncan really a big, small forward, the way he plays? He plays on the wing – he, he's defensively. It's not, it's not the way he plays defense, number one. Yeah, that's true. I agree. The way he plays defense and the way and he hits the boards is not. It's like a set. But he can play. He plays, if you watch him play on the inside, he'll play like he'll play like a big man. He will use, you know, his skill set on the outside with those shots, but that's only to create his own shot in space. He can play like a big man. But I, they're going to need, I don't know, a Zach Randolph. Uh, I'm trying to think of another good example. Oh, uh, Dwight Marcus Howard? Stoll. Would that be all possible? Dwight Howard going to the Heat? You know, it's not something to be ruled out. They might use a draft pick and try and develop somebody. But the, the fact of the matter is that the thing that is missing from their game on the floor is a real big man and a good one. All right, now this uh, the new coach would be fascinating. One of the reasons I was just think about this, you know, Phil Jackson, as of right now, is unemployed coaching-wise. Uh, I know just consulting. Him and Pat Riley have a very interesting relationship because they compete each other when Phil was the coach of the Bulls and Pat of the Knicks, and there is some rivalry there. Uh, but what are the odds, in your opinion, of Phil Jackson coming to coach next season if the Heat lose and Eric Spolster is fired? Slim to none. I, that doesn't that doesn't mean that Pat Riley might not take a shot at courting him. Okay. But Phil Jackson doesn't want to be a coach. He wants to be a GM. It's okay. Now, Doc Rivers, on the other hand, well, he wants to coach. I mean, there 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 are guys out there. Who knows? They might take PJ Carlissimo from off of uh, broadcasting to coach. Yeah. Um, never know. There there are veteran coaches out there to be had and maybe it's not Phil Jackson and I don't know if that's even the right fit per se but uh, you know you add a veteran coach to that team that can actually coach that can coach these stars and former stars and there was some semblance of a system some something where they know what they're doing on the floor the way the Heat play right now is very much 
kind of free for all to whoever can run the fastest and jump the highest goes the win. Yep. Um, it, it's almost like pick up basketball in a lot of ways. Well, I'll tell you something. And other thing, I mean, I keep thinking, you know, you're the first person who's brought this up in a while about the idea of Eric Swester being fired. And I'm sure the Heat lose. That will be talked about a lot. And you're talking about the loyalty issue. Remember, Stan Van Gundy was a coach with the Heat, and they seemed to have a good relationship, him and Pat Riley. And then Stan Van Gundy, quote-unquote, needed to spend time with his family, decided to quit. And what do you know, next year he's with Orlando. So clearly he was fired. Uh, they just did that to save him some embarrassment. But I think sometimes loyalty goes when winning is a stronger precedent, stronger priority. So, uh, I mean, how thick is the loyalty with Pat Ryan and Eric Spolestra? Is another loss in the NBA Finals enough to sever those ties? It should be if Pat Riley thinks with his head. And that it is hard. Should be. The answer is it should be. Because, quite frankly, with the amount of talent, and it's not just the big three, even though it's really more like the big one and, you know, a quarter. One and two halves. Um, they have a great supporting cast. The only thing that's really missing is a good big man. That's the only thing that Heat are missing is a good big man and a system. So, yeah, I, I think that I go after a much more veteran coach if I'm Pat Riley and they lose this. All right, big man. Last because few minutes. It's got to be so frustrating. Well, sure. To have two stars turn down more money to put on that whole show where they say we were going to win not one, not two, not three, not four, but, you know, whatever X amount of championships. You know, you set up those expectations. And then they don't get met? Yeah. You better believe they better bring in somebody smarter. Well, Not Riley knows that. The, the interesting thing is, you talk about the pay cut. I mean, LeBron James could have got, I believe, $30 million with Cleveland. He took half that to come to Miami to win. So LeBron James might push for another coach as well, correct? It could be. Um, I don't know if that's the kind of guy LeBron James is. He's not. He's not as vocal about that kind of stuff off the court. He's a much more quiet kind of guy. Um, that that that's more of a Kobe Bryant thing. <laughs> well, so I was but, just about uh, to say that for all for all of LeBron James' flash and flair and all of his highlight reels, he doesn't behave like a prima donna when he's off the court. All right, Big Ben, last few minutes. Who's winning tonight? What's going to happen the rest of the way? Give us your predictions. Um, I might take – I'm going to go out on a win. And this is a very oh, – I feel it's covered. This is like this is like a 60%. Yeah. This is like a 60-40 split in my head. And I'm going to say that – Miami wins because San Antonio, San Antonio plays overconfident like they did in game two and turns them all over left and right. And uh, Dwayne Wade responds and plays two halves, at least for one game. He has to step up at some point. And this might be his time to respond. And it may be that Eric Spolestra gets a little wiser. And doesn't play LeBron for stretches, sticks him back in and mixes up the Spurs. They're going to have to do something. And and I think there there, there is a sense of urgency about them. Well, you would hope so. <laughs> Cause if, yeah, it may not be LeBron. It may be that Mike Miller and Ray Allen go on a tear. It may be that uh, Norris Cole and Mario Chalmers decide to run around the court and just wear out the Spurs defense. If LeBron James has a big game, meh, so what? It doesn't That doesn't count for anything. But I don't know if he will. I think he is psychologically screwed against the Spurs. All right, so but I think that you're going to find a couple of big role players that are going to make some big plays for them. And that San Antonio may play overconfident. All 
All right, so you like the Heat tonight, although obviously you wouldn't be surprised if the Spurs win. If the Heat do win, do they win the series? No. You still like the Spurs to win the series? Absolutely. Wow. All right. Clutch situation, the amount of time that San Antonio's core has been together, the way Pop has developed all these other guys, that's a championship team. Uh, Miami is a team of individuals. Wow. Some very talented individuals, but they are not a team. They are 12 individuals that just happen to wear the same basketball uniform. Big Ben, bringing it here on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. Even if he thinks the Heat will pull us off, thinks the Spurs will win the series, thinks Eric Spolesta will probably be out of the job, at least if Pat Riley does the right thing. Big Ben, thanks for being on Lewis Live on Israel Sports Radio. Enjoy the game today. Always fun to be on. Absolutely, man. All right. right. Big Ben, Big Ben, breeding it, breeding the thunder and the pain. Very few people have picked, even now, even now that the Spurs are up 2 1, very people have actually said that they will still close the deal. And yet, Big Ben thinks that's what will occur. So, game four is tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern, four in the morning here in Jerusalem, Israel. If you're going to not make it and not stay up to four in the morning, I'm sure you can catch a replay the following day. Very, very exciting stuff. Pivotal game four. Spurs trying to go up three games to one, and the Heat trying to even the series at 2-2. Again, since this format of 2-3-2 in the NBA Finals, the team that has won game three when the series has been tied 1-1 is 12-4-13 in the NBA Finals. And on the line right now to slice and dice this series between San Antonio. Oh, I'm sorry. looks like we have some issues there. We're going to try our guest one more time. If not, uh, we will take a commercial break. My voice could use the rest, so either way, I'm good. Uh, so, again, obviously it doesn't look like the odds. That's for sure. The odds are not in favor of the Miami Heat losing uh, game three, especially the way they did being blown out. Although the Lakers blew out the Celtics in a game in the 84 finals and lost that series, and the Celtics blew out the Lakers in the 85 series and lost the series as well. So a blowout is not necessarily a guarantee of what will occur uh, the rest of the way. All right, we're going to try – bear with us, please. This is live radio. We're going to try to get another phone number for our next guest. He is very busy. He is a radio show host as well, and uh, many times – you know, during the NBA Finals, during championship series, what occurs is they have certain deadlines that come up and things get very hectic. So please uh, bear with us. We will try uh, again a few more times before we take a, a commercial break. Again, you've heard Big Ben break things down. And I, I'd seriously, LeBron's legacy, I mean, you're talking about a lot of different dominoes could occur if they don't pull this thing out. Talk about potentially Eric Spolester being fired. You're talking about potentially players being traded, players, I mean, Ray Allen, I don't know how much time he has left. I know Juwan Howard's 40. This could be his last year. Not that he's the biggest factor to the team, but changes will be made if they don't get it done. Changes probably made if they do get it done, actually. Uh, Time will tell. Very exciting series. It is always good to have a competitive NBA Finals last year. No disrespect to the Thunder, even though they won game one. That was a five-game series. 2011 was competitive, Heat and the Mavericks. That was very entertaining. The six-game series, 2010, was a seven-game series between the Celtics and the Lakers. Andy, I'm unavailable. Take it. All right. It looks like we're having a little bit of trouble getting to our guest. Let's take a commercial break. We will try to reach him. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you for bearing with us. This is Lewis Live on IsraelSportsRadio.com. And we'll be back after a few messages from our sponsors. Thank you for listening to us. And check out the store as well. This is Lewis Live on IsraelSportsRadio.com. You're tuned in to the only all-sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Hey, folks. Kagan here. As you know, I'm always staying on top of the fitness world, keeping up with current trends. One form of exercise that's been around for ages and is currently being rediscovered is suspension bodyweight training. So if you're looking for a way to get in shape, improve your health, and train your body to move in new ways, then the X1 by Israel Gym Systems is for you. Find out more on our website at www.israelgym.com or look for our page on Facebook. 
Israel Gym Systems X1. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hasman. You're already using a credit card every day. Why not feel good every time you make a purchase? When using the HAS Advantage Support Israel Visa Card, a percentage of each purchase you make will be donated to your choice of 24 Israeli-based charities while still earning a reward point for every dollar spent. But wait, these rewards are even better than the standard rewards you get, especially when using them towards Israel travel with the best conversion rate on El Al's Matmid Frequent Flyer Program. Earn double points at some of your favorite supermarkets and restaurants in the U.S. US, as well as discounts all over Israel. If you love traveling and supporting Israel, HAS Advantage is the card for you. Just give us a call toll-free at 1-866-6-ISRAEL. Sign up right now with the code ISR10 to earn 2,500 bonus points. That's 1-866-647-7235. HAS Advantage. Earn rewards. Support Israel. Offer valid for U.S. citizens only. Terms and conditions do apply. When dialing from within Israel, please dial 1-800-200-818. Israel Sports Dynamics specializes in football consulting, equipment, uniforms, and more. Great brands such as Nike, Russell Athletics, Shut Sports Products, and many more. Just one call away with over 30 years coaching experience with university and professional athletes. Harry Hill, owner of ISD, can advise you for all your sports needs. Call 054-581-3248. That's 054-581-3248. Or visit our website at www.isd. I-S-R-A-E-L dot com. If that's not easy enough, click on the ISD banner on the Israel Sports Radio website and be part of the game. Are you tired of paying for expensive gym memberships that you don't use? Are you frustrated by not seeing results? It's time for the X1. Israel Gym Systems is proud to launch the X1 Suspension and Bodyweight Training System. Lose weight, build muscle, improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. With your purchase of the X1, you'll receive a free membership to IsraelGym.com and access to our archives of videos and exercise plans. Sign up today at www.IsraelGym.com and get ready for the new you. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hazman. Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelSportsRadio.com you're tuned in to the only all-sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Hey folks, Kagan here. As you know, I'm always staying on top of the fitness world, keeping up with current trends. One form of exercise that's been around for ages and is currently being rediscovered is suspension bodyweight training. So if you're looking for a way to get in shape, improve your health, and train your body to move in new ways, then the X1 by Israel Gym Systems is for you. Find out more on our website at www.israelgym.com or look for our page on Facebook, Israel Gym Systems X1. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hasman. You're already using a credit card every day. Why not feel good every time you make a purchase? When using the HAS Advantage Support Israel Visa Card, a percentage of each purchase you make will be donated to your choice of 24 Israeli-based charities while still earning a reward point for every dollar spent. But wait, these rewards are even better than the standard rewards you get, especially when using them towards Israel travel with the best conversion rate on El Al's Matmid Frequent Flyer Program. Earn double points at some of your favorite supermarkets and restaurants in the U.S as well as discounts all over Israel. If you love traveling and supporting Israel, HAS Advantage is the card for you. Just give us a call toll-free at 1-866-6-ISRAEL. Sign up right now with the code ISR10 to earn 2,500 bonus points. That's 1-866-647-7235. HAS Advantage. Earn rewards. Support Israel. Offer valid for U.S. citizens only. Terms and conditions do apply. When dialing from within Israel, please dial 1-800-200-818. Israel Sports Dynamics specializes in football consulting, equipment, uniforms, and more. Great brands such as Nike, Russell Athletics, Shut Sports Products, and many more. Just one call away with over 30 years coaching experience with university and professional athletes. Harry Hill, owner of ISD, can advise you for all your sports needs. Call 054-581-3248. That's 054-581-3248. Or visit our website at www.isd. I-S-R-A-E-L dot com. If that's not easy enough, click on the ISD banner on the Israel Sports Radio website and be part of the game. 
Are you tired of paying for expensive gym memberships that you don't use? Are you frustrated by not seeing results? It's time for the X1. Israel Gym Systems is proud to launch the X1 Suspension and Bodyweight Training System. Lose weight, build muscle, improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. With your purchase of the X1, you'll receive a free membership to IsraelGym.com and access to our archives of videos and exercise plans. Sign up today at www.israelgym.com and get ready for the new you. Israel Gym X1, Higia Hazman. Broadcasting live from Israel. Israelsportsradio.com. All right, folks, we were not able to get in touch with Andy Dorf from Dorf on Sports. We apologize about that. Andy is busy with his coverage of the NBA Finals. We were not able to get in touch with him. These things do happen in live radio, obviously. So that will conclude our show for tonight. I want to thank everyone who participated. Our first guest was Andy Gershman, the author of Modern Day Maccabees. You can pick that book up on Kendall as well as Amazon.com. Andy breaking down the problems with LeBron James as well as Tim Tebow being signed to the New England Patriots. We then had an NBA Dave who was disappointed the Knicks did not get to the Easter Conference Finals. He thought that would have been a perfect season for them. Thought Indiana came up and surprised him. We then had on Ryan Fowler from Fox Sports who thinks Josh Hamilton or has reported that Josh Hamilton has said he's not mentally right upstairs, and that's part of the reason for his slump and his struggles this season with the Angels. We then had on good friend of the program, Dove Dovid from MTR Radio, who says it's a discredit and disservice to have the blame go to LeBron James and the credit not go to Greg Popovich for his shutdown of LeBron James. LeBron, of course, has not scored over 20 points in this NBA Finals series. And then our good friend Big Benjamin Block, who thinks even if the Heat win tonight, the Spurs will win the series. As far as my prediction, the Heat will win tonight. And... <sighs> I'm going to say the Spurs either in six or Heat in seven. That's what I'm going to do. Yes, I'm going to do that type of prediction because I'm Mario Lewis and I can. Stay tuned throughout the next coming weeks for a lot of great, great things and great, great stuff. But that's it for tonight. God bless and good night.